It's Saturday night. That means it's time for the Don Tony Show. The wait all week long is finally over. Get Don Tony's perspective on current affairs in the world of pro wrestling and much more. The Don Tony Show. And now your host, the man, the legend, Don Tony. Oh boy. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's like an X rated, uh, X, uh, it's like a Rob Black porn meets lifetime for women. Uh, this sex trafficking lawsuit is just something, um, beyond comprehension. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to, uh, dig into it. Um, we have to do it at least once. Try to be level-headed about it because if you go to one side of the aisle, uh, innocent until proven guilty, um, and I'll tell you why that that mindset is just stupid. The opposite side, uh, convict him, fire everybody, fire anybody that knew Vince. They allowed it. They did this. They did that. And then you got some people out there that just for some reason find this fucking hilarious, hilarious Vince. He's one dirty old man. I think we all agree on that. Um, and you know, there's also another side because the person found the lawsuit is a woman that you are not allowed to even let into your brain the possibility that, uh, and that's why I said a lifetime movie that, you know, uh, maybe some of the kinkiness, uh, she was into as well. Doesn't deserve to be assaulted. Doesn't deserve to be mistreated. Um, unfortunately for 99% of you out there and yours truly, we don't have that kind of sexual fetish. It's interesting because about maybe two months ago, and I listen, I didn't rehearse. How do you rehearse? How do you prepare for something like this? The only thing that I did was I read the entire lawsuit. Now, we're going to get into a good portion of it in a few minutes. I have screenshots of all the alleged text messages, which I do believe are real. Um, no lawyer in 2023 is going to throw that out there as exhibits unless they are certain that they were authentic. I'm not disputing that. Um, but, you know, there there's this mindset out there that someone, because they're a woman, that they are 100% victim in this. Am I blaming any of this on her? No. But it's very interesting when you start looking at it, this is not an 18 year old girl. This is someone who got hired to make $75,000 life changing, you know, making someone well off plus, and this is why I also say the lifetime movie. If you ever watched a BET movie, a Lifetime movie, and HLN or any of these movies where women get into these controversies sexual wise, how does this woman not do a simple Google search to search Vince McMahon 2005, Vince McMahon 2009, Christy Hemme right before the Saudi Arabia deal and all this other stuff? And why would you keep going? To the man's condo. Why not go to human resource? And I'm not saying, oh, well, maybe she was afraid. I'm talking when you met for the job, when you had repeated meetings, why do you go to the man's condo? What happened to all your friends, girl? I don't know. You know about this dirty old man, girl? What, does that make sense to go to his condo? So things are not as cut and dry as you think. I think just, again, these are all opinions. These are all opinions. I personally think that this was 
uh, a sexual, it's like nine and a half weeks, fatal attraction, all this other stuff. It's something that got beyond control. And Vince McMahon took advantage of the situation. Um, Vince McMahon is a dirty old man. Now, you remember at the beginning of the show, I said that uh, people that are saying innocent and proven guilty, it's kind of, it's a very flawed argument. Do you know what's been absent for the last 24 hours? Not even. You know what's been absent across the net? Doesn't matter if he is cleared of sexual trafficking, if he's cleared of the word that begins with an R and rhymes with grape. If he's cleared of all of that, and this is just a vindictive woman that got scorned and got into a sexual, you know, love affair that just went into triple X territory and then got dumped. Vince McMahon's behavior is unprofessional. It is misconduct. Doesn't have to be illegal. It is behavior that is unacceptable for World Wrestling Entertainment Incorporated. It is unacceptable for TKO Group Holdings Incorporated. It is unacceptable for the stockholders. It is unacceptable for the board of directors. And because I do research, there's a little bit more that's going to be coming out of this. Because remember the timeline, and this is why we're going to get into this in a little bit. We're not going to do it right at the beginning of the show, and I'll tell you why. I don't ever do this, but I'm going to put a QR code on the screen. If anyone tuning in right now wants to download the actual lawsuit, my copy, where I highlighted some very important points that we're going to get into today because it does make an interesting timeline. And you start asking yourself, why is John Laurinaitis and Vince McMahon the only two names mentioned in this? How come everybody else is Exhibit A? Corporate B, corporate one, you know, referee, uh, you know, looking at her nudes and masturbating. I, I know this sounds disgusting. Warning, this is very adult material. But you start asking yourself, how come none of these names are mentioned? And I think that there is a, a real legitimate reason why. We'll get into that a little bit later. But if you click on that QR code, it'll give you the PDF so you could actually read the papers as I go through all now we're not going to read every single minute of it because it's 67 pages but um I'm going to get into some very important points some that I think will give you a little bit of clarity as far as what went on um and also you know Kevin and I are going to talk about it briefly on Monday because remember Monday it is the return yes cheap plug it is the official return of the Don, Tony, and Kevin Castle show. We did Royal Rumble predictions earlier this week. If you have not checked it out yet, you must, because we talked about WWE and Netflix. We talked about The Rock on the board of directors. We talked about The Rock versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 41. We talked about a lot, not just predictions, but officially Monday is the return. And you know what's most amazing about it? Seriously, put such a smile on our face. Within 48 hours of doing that show, the Don, Tony, and Kevin Castle show was ranked in the top 20 amongst UK shows. And in the United States, it was in the top 50 already. Just to show you what kind of love and response everyone is out there. And I am not throwing shade at any other show out there that works hard, has a great audience. Seriously, you obviously offer something that your audience enjoys. You know, even if it's a different style, even if everything is epic, amazing, fluffy rabbits everywhere or shit on everything or just, you know, whatever, just looking at eye candy. Somebody asked me the other day, DT, why are, are, aren't you and Kevin doing video? Because we're not eye candy. Seriously. Really? So, um, and now you see why we want to keep everything in one area. Of course, channel members get a video version. And if you noticed the, the video version this week, we put like 15 thumbnails in there. Every conversation had a thumbnail for that particular topic. So this Monday, it is official. So if anyone out there doesn't have a QR code reader and wants to just download the PDF the normal way in a browser, go to tiny url.com slash dt on vince suit i think that's what it is dt on vince suit 
tinyurl.com slash DT on Vinsuit. You can download because when I get into some particulars, especially when we show the screenshots of Vince McMahon's text messaging, um, you definitely want to look along as we, we get into it. So we have a lot more to get into besides that. I mean, it, this is not let's crucify Vince McMahon to the cross. You look at Caligula, you look at what was that Tom Cruise movie? Eyes wide open, eyes wide shut, you know, poke my eyes, whatever. There are movies with sexual fantasy. You know, are we supposed to go back to those movies and say that woman was assaulted? That woman was abused. That woman was manipulated. No, it goes on both sides. But Vince McMahon, obviously, you become a sex addict. I would not be shocked if we find out in the future that Vince McMahon is being treated for being a sex addict. Seriously. And let me also say one last thing, and then we'll get into some Royal Rumble stuff. We got to talk a couple of quick things about SmackDown yesterday. If you saw the opening video, I think he deserved it. I mean, yes, it's Miami. Yes, it's Florida, home of NXT. But Trick Williams, man, you and I have been talking about him for well over a year. You know, a year or so ago when Carmelo Hayes was on the road to taking Braun Breaker's championship, Carmelo Hayes, the future, the future, the future, or him is now, him, the future, him, 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 him. And you quietly just saw Trick Williams. No, you know, jealousy towards Carmelo Hayes, but you know what? I ain't being no fucking Marty Jannetty of this team. And that guy just did his thing, did his thing, did his thing. And yes, his music is awesome. It's got an awesome beat. You know, whoop that trick goes perfect with it. But you could see there's a presence. You could see the charisma. You could see the athleticism. You could see how his presence in the ring knows how to sell, give, tell a story. That man, a couple of times we said, would not be surprised if Trick Williams ends up the bigger star than Carmelo Hayes. It's a little unfair to say, but last night you got a good idea. Uh, and yes, this is why you need to know your audience. This is why when you go in certain areas, whether you're WWE or TNA or MLW or AEW, you got to know your audience. You got to know what is going to sell. Just because it's a fantasy match for you, just because it makes you rock hard, you know, unfortunately, when we get into this week in ratings, Adam Copeland versus Minoru Suzuki, lowest 30 minutes in a night, 20 minutes in a night. Fans were turning the channel off as the match went on. That's not good. Same thing for NXT. Let's also be fair. NXT did a 14 or 15 minute overrun and fans were still tuning it off. You got to sometimes, especially when you tour, you got to know your audience. So look at, this is why Kevin and I, this past week, we had the conversation about if WrestleMania 41 ends up overseas. Now, personally, if it stays in the States, I think Miami, I think Miami, almost definitely. You just picture The Rock and Roman Reigns, WrestleMania 41 in Miami. I, I could see it. Um, where the Dolphins play, I think they hold like 69,000 people. Um, not the Marlins Park, because everybody's saying the Marlins Park. The Marlins Park seats, I think, 30-something thousand. But um, if it's international, you know, you see the audience. You see how WWE even regionalizes some of their talents on there, and the crowds are just amazing. So, all right. A um, couple other things from yesterday's SmackDown. Ava Rain made a cameo. You know, Ava Rain got crapped on a little bit very unfairly because she was announced as the NXT general manager. It's funny. Kevin and I had a conversation a couple of days ago that The Rock now being on the TKO board of directors, will we see Ava Rain like pushed in a couple of storylines in a matter of three days? She's the GM. She's on SmackDown. I thought she did a decent job yesterday. I mean, she didn't have to do much. Um, basically, Nick Aldis and Ava Rain were, uh, they brought back the um, the spinner with all the balls inside, and wrestlers were taking balls out to determine what their spot was going to be. I think Bianca Belair may have gotten number 30 because when she saw that number, she's like, I'm winning the Royal Rumble. I think it's like 28, 29, or 30. 
Bianca Belair is going to be 28, 29, or 30. By the way, there's a rumor going around, and I already see a war brewing. There is a guy, and I don't remember his name. I don't follow him, but there's a guy in the wrestling news world that said, absolutely, positively, CM Punk is not going to be back at, at Survivor Series. I spoke to people close to CM Punk, and he is emphatically not returned. And he returned the next day. Now this guy is saying, like, this person is not going to show, and this person is not going to show. And some woman, never heard of her before, but she's got a huge following. I mean, you take some of the biggest wrestling podcasters, add their, their followers all together, and still less than this woman. I don't remember her name, but she rubbed it in the guy's face. She took the screenshot from Survivor Series, and he, she said, is this you? And I was like, God, that was a good one. Here's the problem. The same breath that she does that, she posts a screenshot of her and CM Punk. And she's like, oh, I met CM Punk at Starbucks today. And CM Punk told me that he's going to be number five in the Royal Rumble. Now, I don't know how I feel about the fact that she revealed that. I, she's excited. I have nothing against the girl at all. But if CM Punk does not come out at number five, you pretty much did the same thing that this other nitwit did. And I just, I, I see that guy right now begging, pleading to the wrestling gods, please don't let it be number five. Please don't let it. And she, maybe she'll delete the tweet. You know, I don't care. This is why Kevin and I are so freaking excited to come back. You see all the Mercedes Monet stuff the last 24 hours. Oh, Tony Khan kind of hinted that Mercedes is coming back. WWE, oh, Mercedes is in Boston. Or did you see that yesterday? Mercedes in Boston. She was having coffee in Boston. Yeah, she was with Bailey. What does that mean? Bailey could fly on a plane and Sasha is on a no-fly list? I'm not saying Sasha's going to be there today. But people are just doing everything. The best one today was people close to Vince McMahon are likely to be fired from WWE. As if we're supposed to forget 2022 when Vince McMahon stepped down amidst sexual allegations. Um, not for nothing, Triple H was working there in 2022. Kevin Dunn, who's no longer there, was Kevin Dunn in this lawsuit? You'll be the judge. He's not mentioned. And again, when we get into this lawsuit in a little bit, I think you'll see a little bit of a pattern and you'll start seeing why um, some names are not in this lawsuit. More than one person Oh, more than two people, I should say, Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis. They're the two that are being sued. Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis have been accused of some very, very disgusting things. Now, I don't like the Bellas. I, I don't care much about the family either. But, man, do I feel bad for the mom, seriously, to see all this stuff. I, I could only imagine what she's going through. But many, 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 many other people sexually, allegedly sexually assaulted this woman and they're not in the lawsuit and i think there's a reason why and let me tell you something if vince mcmahon is going to have this i don't give a fuck attitude a lot of names may end up being forced to be exposed because there's some wild accusations we got it we'll show you the screenshots um so ava rain showed up yesterday on smackdown also you see this now and you say to yourself why didn't WWE go with Umberto Carrillo and Angel Garza instead of Joaquin Wilde and Cruz del Toro? Maybe creative thought that Joaquin Wilde and Cruz del Toro had something special. But Electra Lopez, funny because Tuesday after Electra Lopez and Lola Vice had the split up, you know, we knew that, you know, somebody was being elevated. I, we thought Lola Vice, hey, maybe Lola Vice will be in the Royal Rumble today. But Electra Lopez shows up and they reform Legado del Fantasma. Remember, they needed a woman in this group because the LWO had a woman in their group. And soon BFAB is going to be with Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits. And Scarlet is with the Final Testament. You see where this is going, everyone? This is the year of the faction. That's what I said about three weeks ago. The year of the faction. Every, almost everybody's going to have a faction. And every faction... Almost everyone has got to be a woman unless you're the bloodline. And who knows? Maybe Naomi ends up being in the bloodline after everything is said and done. And then you got Rhea Ripley and the Judgment Day. And you got Alpha Academy with their woman. Everybody's got a faction. Everybody's got a woman. And I'm not 
I don't have a problem with it because obviously you're not going to have men on women violence. A woman can attack a man on WWE programming, but a man cannot attack a woman. The only way a man could have any offense on a woman on TV is if the man moves out of the way and a woman just runs into something. See Rhea Ripley versus Akira Tozawa, and you'll know what I'm talking about. But Electra Lopez looked like a million dollars yesterday. And uh, very, very cool because anybody that follows NXT, remember when they were in the SUV and Santos Escobar lost to Tony D? And Santos was going to be driving away, but he wasn't going to leave without his friends and with his family, I should say. And he drove away. And Electra Lopez was doing pee pee in the bathroom. And she's like, Oh, I missed the ride. And he kind of felt bad for Electra Lopez. Well, she worked hard. She continued working. She's back. So that's pretty cool. If you are interested, just a random tidbit, Cody Rhodes was on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Uh, I saw a couple of clips online of the skits, and it's pretty funny. Um, yeah, uh, this, I guess, has to do with, like, Superman or something, but uh, I don't understand why. Uh, and what's that guy's name again? Ken Jong. I, to me, he's most famous for being dropped on his head. Was it by Cena or Umaga? No, Umaga was jackass. That had to have been, I think it was Cena. He got thrown outside the ring. Dr. Ken Jeong, you know, you know where he's most famous right now for those dry eye commercials? You ever see those dry eye commercials that he's in? Like, he's, he's there and he's like, and his eyes are all red. And I'm like, come on, you got to go one step further. You got to get in your car and you got to drive with the red eyes. Get into an accident. This is why you need to use this, this stuff. Um, he's not bad. I, I don't dislike the guy. I didn't like when these guest hosts showed up on WWE TV and just went into extra business on their own, ad-libbing a little bit, sometimes taking it personal when they're supposed to be insulted. You know, we've seen it more than one time. So when you see somebody like, fall on their head, you know, as long as they're not permanently injured, you're like, good, good, character-wise. I saw The Hangover. The Hangover was an okay movie, but it was one of those movies that was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was like half asleep, and I threw it on, and I was like watching it. So, all right, we're, we're going off topic here. Uh, CM Punk has a little blog online, and uh, we actually shared some of the Cora Jade photos the other day. She had the surgery to repair her torn ACL, MCL. She's going to be out for the most of part of 2024. She was hanging out with CM Punk, Roxanne Perez, and I don't know if that's JC Jane. That looks like JC Jane. I think it is JC Jane. But CM Punk's got a cool little blog online leading up to the Royal Rumble. Speaking of the Royal Rumble, we have the final odds as far as who's going to win. But also some additional odds came out about little incidental items related to the Royal Rumble. Will this person show? Will this person show? And I'm going to share those odds with you. Now, remember, this year, there's only four matches. I don't know if they've ever had an event for the Royal Rumble with only four matches. The lowest that I could recall is five. And if they did four, it might be in the 80s early 90s i'm talking like early i did a four matches but one thing you know for sure each royal rumble match is going to go two minute two hours you know combined at least they're going to go two hours and you know the roman reigns fatal four-way match is going to go 15 to 25 minutes and then you have kevin owens and logan paul now i got a little video clip with Kevin Owens and Logan Paul, if you are interested, they teased a little bit of a brawl in the Performance Center. Uh, my thoughts are still the same. If you remember last week's confrontation with Logan Paul and Kevin Owens, you remember Kevin Owens said that there's nothing, there's, you, you will not be able to knock me out. You know, it, and basically what Kevin Owens was trying to say is no matter how, you know, good Logan Paul is, like his punch will not knock out Kevin Owens. Logan Paul 
absolutely, positively, obviously has to use a weapon, likely brass knucks. He is going to knock out Kevin Owens with brass knucks. But if you want a little teaser, a little bit of a build. And let me tell you something. I love that WWE does this because when it's in an empty arena, you hear everything and things are enhanced. Now for dynamite, when there's only 2000 fans, you know, it doesn't come off on TV as well. But when you're in a tiny little gym, and that's why some people love going to indie wrestling shows. When you're in an intimate environment, every little thing is enhanced. All the sounds are enhanced. And I love this confrontation between the two. It only runs a minute, but I think you'll appreciate it. Walk away, Kevin. Walk away. Hey. Whoa. Hey. Hey. Come on. Whoa. 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 Hey. Hey. Stop. Stop. Hey. I noticed that little epic fail by Kevin Owens at the end, trying to pick up the prime energy drink. It just slipped out of his hands. So um, another little Royal Rumble tidbit, since a lot of you like these little video clips that Drew McIntyre does, this is Drew McIntyre earlier today, a little reflection prior to the Royal Rumble. I'm just about to drive from Miami where SmackDown was and where I battered them is last night to where I lived for over 10 years, the location of the Royal Rumble, St. Petersburg, Florida, like a four hour drive. And my favorite line of the week I've seen so far is from an official WWE video post called Drew McIntyre's Quest for Gold. An awesome watch to see what brought us to where we are now. It started a little sooner, but nonetheless, a fantastic video showing the whole story. So great job, guys. Then if you look in the description, it says Drew McIntyre's Descent into Madness. Madness, the state of being mentally ill. So just to clarify, just because I'm the only one, not just in WWE, but feels like anywhere these days who states facts and tells the truth, that makes me mad. Maybe that's the way of the world now. Maybe if you check history, someone that tells too much truth, well, that equals you better call them crazy. But you're right. I am mad, and the actual definition of that, angry, with some of the BS I've been dealing with around here. You think you know what's going on, and what's gonna happen? You've no idea. I'm the wrench in all your WrestleMania plans. Monday, I said I was gonna beat Priest. I beat him. I also said he's not ready for the world title, and he's not. Who's going to elevate the title after Seth has taken it as far as his body has allowed him to take it? Gunther, doing a great job as IC champion, but this goes beyond what happens in the ring. Is he ready? Cody, the great pretender, maybe, but he doesn't truly understand what it takes to be the world champion. Is he mentally tough enough? Punk, no, the title literally drove him insane. This is full circle. Tropicana Field, where I was WWE Champion for so long in the Thunderdome. I don't just need me to win, to move Raw to the next level and have my moment personally. You need me to win. Have I lied to you yet? All right. That's Drew McIntyre talking Royal Rumble. Now, let's get into quickly some final odds leading into the Royal Rumble uh, as of right now, CM Punk and Gunther are the odds on favorites to win the Royal Rumble. CM Punk has expanded his lead over Cody Rhodes. And if you tuned into our predictions earlier this week, I'm going with a dusty finish with CM Punk and Cody Rhodes. Kev is going with Gunther. I think logical picks and remember with the betting world if cm punk and cody rhodes both win the royal rumble i guess that means that everybody loses their bets because it's a tie 
we compared it to the NFL. If I take the Giants with 10 points and, and, and they end up losing by 10, I win zilch. I lose. Ties go our loss. So right now, CM Punk is the odds-on favorite at minus 120. Cody Rhodes is at minus 220. And Gunther is at minus 175. So you would bet $175 to get back 100. Oh, excuse me. You would bet $100. Well, no, yeah. Bet $175 to get back 100. They are the odds-on favorites. Um, after that, the odds are tremendous. The Rock is next at plus a thousand. Then you get into Drew McIntyre, Jey Uso, Sami Zayn, Brock Lesnar, and, and you know I wanted to say something earlier about Brock Lesnar. I'll get into it with the lawsuit, but I'll just tell you something briefly now. Uh, Brock Lesnar has been tied into this lawsuit. When we are done talking about it later on today, I ask you honestly. Did Brock Lesnar do anything wrong? Why should Brock Lesnar be fired? Did he assault this woman or people calling for his dismissal because he's a good friend of Vince McMahon? Cancel culture will be coming for The Undertaker. Cancel culture will be gunning for John Cena. Cancel culture will be gunning for Brock Lesnar if they are ever seen in public with Vince McMahon again. We'll talk about it. So um, Brock Lesnar is at plus 2,500. Then you get Damian Priest, Kevin. O Believe it or not, a lot of people think Damian Priest is going to be in the final four, and I think that is excellent. For the most part, the final four, most people are choosing Cody, CM Punk, Drew McIntyre, Damian Priest, and Gunther. You know, combination of those names. Uh, Sami Zayn, again, I would have gone with Sami Zayn if Drew McIntyre was champion right now. But, um, and then you obviously have to do something else. By the way, on the women's side, remember Becky Lynch was the favorite for quite some time. Bailey now has become the favorite at minus 220. And honestly, yesterday, the Kabuki Warriors defeated Katana Chance and Caden Carter to become the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. That is done for Bayley. And would some of you are going to say to me, DT, what are you talking about? Well, remember what happened on Raw when Bayley was invited to Raw, but she went into business for herself. So she's not welcomed at Raw again. But now with the Kabuki Warriors as the Tag Team Champions for both brands, now Bailey will show up on Raw with the Kabuki Warriors. She will tease that she is going to challenge Rhea Ripley for WrestleMania, but she hasn't made her decision yet. And that's going to piss off EO Sky. And they're going to be, what do you mean you haven't made your decision yet? And that's going to be the beginning of the end of Bailey in damage control. Um, I think that's the way they're going with it. That's why the Kabuki Warriors won those titles. Caden Connor and Katana Chance, you know, listen, they had a, a, a quick little run. I mean, it was very, very uneventful. You know, they only had like two, three title defenses. I think two were, were against Chelsea Green. One they won, one they defended it. And then you had, uh, um, who did they just face? Uh, not Sonya Deville and Zoe Stark. Who did they just face on Raw? I'm trying to, re trying to remember. Maybe, no, they actually, I think they only defended against Piper Nevin and Chelsea Green. Did they beat anybody else for those titles? I don't think so. But the point is, they still have a long career ahead of them. They got a little exposure. That's fine. I will tell you this. If you are curious, you could go see it. I don't have the clip because you got to look at the WWE tweet that goes with the clip. I feel really bad for Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. Something feels like WWE is kind of soured on them. I don't care that they're now called the Unholy Union. That should have been their name when they first were introduced on the SmackDown roster. They've been together for a while. Now suddenly they're the un Unholy Union. They've been hanging out at fire and, and sacrifices and all this dark goth stuff for eight, nine months. It, it didn't feel unholy. Vince McMahon sounds more like an unholy union. And I'm not throwing jokes, but seriously, 
if you go on their Twitter right now, they're showing bonus footage of other wrestlers getting their entrance for the Royal Rumble. And there's a video on Twitter right now where it says that uh, other participants, including Shotzi and I don't, I think it might be Natalia. Shotzi and Natalia, Shotzi and someone else get their entrance. The video is a minute and 35 seconds long. A minute and 10 seconds of it have Alba Fire and Isla Dawn in it. They're not mentioned in the tweet at all. You watch the video and it's like various participants, including Shotzi Blackheart and someone else. And I'm like, wait, there's only four people in this video. They, did, they wouldn't even name drop Alba Fire and Isla Dawn. Go look on their Twitter and you'll see what I'm talking about. So right now, Bailey is the favorite. And then we got some interesting choices. Now, a lot of people are still going with Becky Lynch to win this. Um, I think Kev is going with Becky, and I'm going with Bailey on this one. Jay Cargill is the third favorite on the list at plus 600. Now, a lot of reports today are that Jay Cargill is in the Rumble today. Um, I don't see her winning it. I see her getting eliminated by like six, seven women. And that's, you know, it took that many women to eliminate Jay Cargill, but I think she'll do a decent job. Nia Jax is next on the list. And then after that, you have Liv Morgan, Mercedes Monet, Bianca Belair. I'm a little shocked that Bianca Belair is like plus 1,200 right now. I don't see Bianca Belair having a world championship match at WrestleMania 40. For all we know, it could be end up, it can end up being Bianca Belair versus Jay Cargill at WrestleMania 40. It's, that's not out of the question. But those are your odds as far as the two Rumble matches. Now, yes, Roman Reigns is at minus 4,000. Roman Reigns ain't losing the belt tonight. And Logan Paul's at minus 3,000. Logan Paul's not losing the belt tonight. Now, if you want some other odds, Alexa Bliss showing up in the Royal Rumble is at plus 400. Braun Strowman is at plus 100. People think Braun Strowman is ready for a return. If you bet on Cody Rhodes and Jade Cargill to both win the Rumble matches, you have to do it as a package. It is plus 2,000. If you choose CM Punk and Becky Lynch to win the Royal Rumble matches, it is only plus 600. Why is that? I mean, yes, CM Punk is the favorite, but Becky Lynch is quite a distance away. Very, very interesting. Gunther and Bailey. If Gunther and Bailey win the Royal Rumble matches, it's plus 300. I find it interesting that they don't give us an option if Cody and Bailey won the Royal Rumble. That is not an option in the betting world right now. Maybe because it's too predictable. I don't know. Who goes the longest in the Royal Rumble? Cody Rhodes is the favorite at minus 100. Gunther is next at plus 200. CM Punk is follows him with plus 400. And then it goes down the list. Uh, Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. You know, there's some people I think that Dominic Mysterio is going to go very, very long in this match. There's a lot of people betting on Dominic Mysterio to go very long into this match. On the women's side, the women that are, are uh, the best odds to go to longest is Bailey, Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Raquel Rodriguez. I hope she can return. Her skin issue, you know, that that uh, condition that she had. Um, oh, God, I almost said SARS. If she had SARS, we have a problem. Um, MS, MCSA, something like that. She, uh, it's the immune disease that she's got. No cure, but could only be treated and maintained. So I hope, I hope she could return. Um, after that, you have Asuka. Ivy Nile, Ivy Nile considered one to be going along as I don't see that. Will John Cena appear plus 1000? Will Okada appear plus 200? A lot of people think Okada is going to show up. MJF to appear plus 300. I do not believe MJF or Okada will be in this Royal Rumble. And then who gets the most eliminations in the Royal Rumble? Gunther is the favorite right now at minus 100. Cody Rhodes is at plus 200. Drew McIntyre, 400. Solo and CM Punk at 500. 
Bobby Lashley and Damian Priest at a thousand. Interesting that they don't have Bronson Reed uh, that high up. Bronson Reed is like plus fifteen hundred right now. Most eliminations on the women's side. Raquel Rodriguez is the favorite at minus a hundred. Nia Jax is at plus a hundred. Jay Cargill, Bailey, Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch, and Zoe Stark follow it up. I don't even know if Oscar's in the Royal Rumble. I don't think so. The reason I was told the reason why they're getting the title match the night before is so the Kabuki Warriors have some high profile moment Royal Rumble weekend. I'm not convinced that Oscar's in the Royal Rumble this year. I don't know why Oscar keeps popping up on these lists. Will Naomi appear? Minus 700. So Naomi, out of almost all of these extra betting, Naomi is the one that is most obvious going to occur. Will we see NXT members in the Royal Rumble? Minus 100 that they will, and I believe that they will. Will Sasha Banks appear? Plus 150. And uh, again, the final four, the favorites, CM Punk, Gunther, Cody Rhodes, Drew McIntyre, Jey Uso, Sami Zayn, then you go to Damian Priest, Shinsuke Nakamura, and then on the women's side, Bailey, Becky Lynch, Nia Jax, Jay Cargill, Raquel Rodriguez. So those are your odds. Um, I think, you know, I don't think this is going to be a, an event that we have to overthink the outcome. It's going to be very creative because it's very obvious. But, you know, the people that the fans want to see win are the high odds. So, you know, WWE's not going to screw the fans over by giving it totally to someone else unless somebody returns and everybody go banana. So, but I think that this event is going to be a very predictable outcome show, you know, when you think about it. But what happens during the matches? That's going to be the question. Now, I know the a video, uh, a video version of Kevin I shows are not played on YouTube in its entirety other than members. But if you are interested, there is a video in on the channel right now that you could watch Kevin I getting into the women's. You know, I just realized it. There's no odds for AJ Lee at all. There was nothing on this list about AJ Lee. I'm kind of blown away by that. But you could check out our women's predictions. You could check out our men's predictions. We put that up there. Roman Reigns and The Rock at WrestleMania 41. That's another conversation. And then later today, um, you know, I kind of held off about putting this simply because of the Vince McMahon stuff that came out. But uh, I'm going to be uploading the Raw is Netflix discussion that we had because we got into a lot of particulars that no one got into. And we answered a lot of questions as far as, you know, the uh, the Netflix uh, aspect of everything, but I put on on the bottom, uh, Raw is Netflix and chill. If anybody knows why I wrote Netflix and chill, props to you. Props to you. Props to you. All right. Should we get into Vince? Oh, you know what? Before we get into Vince, very quickly, Kevin Patrick is released by WWE. Good riddance. Um, moving on. No, 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 no. I, I don't want to be that harsh on Kevin Patrick. Uh, maybe I should have ran a mile and come back here and talk about Kevin Patrick. I'd be out of breath. Uh, Kevin Patrick. Uh, uh, welcome to Smack. Uh, I think um, Kevin Patrick is a very, very, very likable person. Very professional. Good guy. Works hard. I do not believe that because he's a good guy and works hard, oh, WWE should find a place for him. You know, yeah, we could say the same thing about Mackenzie Mitchell, but this is a publicly traded company. You don't sometimes keep people on the payroll simply because you like them. They're brought in for a particular reason, and if they're not delivering for that reason, they will be eliminated. I think more people are kind of in denial, like, wow, I can't believe Triple H would just get rid of Kevin Patrick like that. Like, I could see Vince doing that, but Triple H, come on, make him a backstage announcer. Make him this, send him to NXT, do this and that. No, Kevin Patrick, 
everybody criticized his commentating for a very long time, including yours truly. And it got to the point, they put him on SmackDown. They put uh, Michael Cole there to ease Kevin Patrick in. And then after a little bit of time, they're like, all right. Um, it's almost like, you know, it's like a kid that has training wheels on a bicycle. Michael Cole was the training wheels on the bicycle. And Kevin Patrick is riding down the street. Oh, this is great. <laughs> and then finally, dad takes the training wheels off. And what happens? He got criticized. So WWE let him go. Now everybody loves Kevin Patrick. Uh, you know what? Social media does not influence decisions as much as you think. But when the majority of people out there say, oh, God, he's awful. Oh, God, he sucks. Oh, God, why do they have him? Oh, God, he, he's all that. Sooner or later, it's going to backfire. Kevin Patrick is gone. I like the guy. I hope he stays in wrestling. Something tells me he's going to get back into sports play by play. Kind of like uh, Jimmy Smith. I thought Jimmy Smith did an incredible job for WWE. Jimmy Smith being let go shocks me a thousand times more than Kevin Patrick being let go. Adnan Verk, you know what? Great one, mystery man. I put Kevin Patrick in the Adnan Verk territory. Um, Kevin Patrick probably a little bit more likable because Kevin Patrick was a little bit more sociable online. But I think Kevin Patrick, ultimately, you're going to hear him go back to sports outside of WWE. I wish him the best. I wish him the best. But he obviously was not to the standards of a Raw or a SmackDown. Okay. Before we get into Vince, then we'll wrap up with ratings. I want to get into a couple of super shout outs because uh, definitely this kind of has to do with uh, the topics. Let me get into first, Mr. Rizzo. Thank you for the 10 spot. Hi, chat and DT. So Raj Giri tweeted something interesting. Quote, I'll give a hint regarding surprises for tonight. The WWE TNA relationship is reaching new levels in the Royal Rumble. Um, okay. All right. I mean, if we see some TNA influence in the Royal Rumble, I'm fine with it. Here's the problem with it, though. And listen. I'm not criticizing Raj Yiri, but I think everybody realizes now that Twitter has become, please look at me, please, you know, look at, you know, like everybody will write something, whether it's the, the biggest insult to Vince or the, the, the most happiness to, towards Vince's release or, you know, anything, Mercedes Monet, CM Punk, Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, AE, Okada, uh, everybody's got to write something to be recognized and noticed. That's why, like I said, I'd rather wait, save my breath and do it here for all of you or do it with Kev on Mondays. Now, yes, today is the last Saturday for a little while that we're doing the Don Tony show because a lot of the news that we discuss on Saturdays will be done on Mondays with Kev, but I will keep Saturdays open. So that if we do have some blockbuster news happen a day or two before I will do a special episode Saturdays at noon. So I promise you in the next couple of months, you will get a couple of Saturdays of shows. So, you know, definitely look out for it. But that's why I don't post the stuff on Twitter like I used to, because everybody out there's got to say something to get recognized. And I'm not interested in that. My problem with Raj Yeri's tweet is Mickey James, Royal Rumble a couple of years ago. Oh, we're going to get Moose soon. Oh, we're going to get Josh Alexander soon. It led to nothing. TNA is technically TNA is pretty much Switzerland in the world of pro wrestling. And I say that as a compliment, what TNA is going to do is TNA is going to bring in talents with no contract. Obviously they'll work a couple of dates and then they'll work other places. 
And then maybe to work out something where somebody from TNA could show up somewhere here and then in return, you get something back. You know, I think that's where we're getting it. TNA, listen, I got the ratings for TNA this week. Last week, we got into their rating as well. And, you know, yes, we get the ratings before everyone else. No one uh, will ever give us credit for it, which is fine. But I think their rating this week was, last week, their rating was 121. But their demo was 0.02 which is a 180% increase from, you know, before they went back to the TNA brand. But this week, their rating dropped down to 102, from 121 to 102. It may not sound like a lot, but when you actually do division, you know, 102 is about a, what, 16, 17% drop? You know, you you add a couple of zeros to that, and you look at Raw with a 17% drop. If Raw has a million and a half viewers... 10% would be 150,000. 15% would be 225,000. So now you go 18%. Now you're talking 300, close to a 300,000 viewership drop for Raw. Everybody would be like, oh shit, Raw, oh my God, it went down to 18%. Yeah, 18% is a lot. You know, at the flip side, you know, because their ratings are low, you put a couple of names on there and you might rebound. Now, wasn't Okada on TNA this Thursday and the rating went down? You see where I'm going with this. You know, TNA, any rub to possibly get a little more eyes on them, they're going to do. And that's the right format. TNA, to survive in 2024, needs to work with a lot of other companies. They do have some people signed exclusive there. And that is a good thing. There's no reason why Moose or Josh Alexander or anybody else, there's no reason why they can't appear once or twice in a different company. Why? I mean, unless the other company doesn't want any focus on TNA at all. I personally think when WWE used Mickey James a couple of years ago, you know, it was cool and everything. But when everybody was like, oh, the forbidden door is opening, I'm like, yeah. Remember that? Never thought it was open. So, you know, this is nice and everything. But, you know, just to see somebody in the WWE ring get thrown over in five minutes and then there's nothing else, I'm not interested in that. You know, it's a nice visual. Oh, wow, look who's in the Rumble. And then let's see a month later. Let's see three months later if anything goes down. All right. Got another super shout out. And this has to do, I believe, with Vince. Oh, thank you, Rizzo. Um, well, actually, no. Daniel Hayes Valdez. Thank you for the 10 spot. Daniel, I want to see the 94 finish, but simultaneously done with the heel hiding outside gimmick. So once he slides back in, he's automatically the winner, and that should be Jinder. If Jinder Mahal won the Royal Rumble, uh, I think cancel... You can't do cancel WWE Network unless you're outside the U.S. But if you put cancel WWE, which would be interesting because when people get that vicious on gender online, I think Tony Khan would have a conniption. Tony Khan would have a conniption. Um, Jinder Mahal is not going to win, obviously. I think Jinder Mahal will have some comedy in the match. But if you really want to use this in a way, put Gunther. Imagine if Gunther was outside the ring and, you know, people forgot about him. I don't know how you forget Gunther outside the ring, unless he slides under the ring. And then, you know, Cody and CM Punk both go over the top rope and everybody thinks they won, but Gunther is back in the ring. And then everybody's like, oh shit, he never got eliminated. I could see it. I Listen, I, I don't think you'll do that. But um, it's not a bad idea. Listen, one thing I think we could say, whether Vince was there or not, whether Triple H is there or not, over the years, they've been pretty good with their Royal Rumble finishes. Like, there's been a couple of years where the, the who, who the person won, you kind of disagreed with. But as far as the creativity in the matches, was there ever really a bad Royal Rumble You know, I think that what one of the Royal Rumble moments, I mean, we have so many awesome moments. I was watching, again, Too too Cool and their Royal Rumble moment, which is, you know, just really nice to see going back. 
But, you know, you had some others in the Royal Rumble that was less to be desired. But I think whatever happens tonight is going to be controversial, but it'll also be something very interesting. And I really, I feel the 94 elimination, plus the 30 year anniversary of the 94 Rumble. So I don't care, think anniversaries make a big deal out of it, but it could very well happen. Scorpio 1117 with the two spot. He hopes Jade Cargill wins the Rumble and he's at work. Good. Good. Make that money, man. Don't spend it on me. Make that money and enjoy the Royal Rumble. But listen, if Jade Cargill wins the Rumble, um, I don't want to make any bets, you know, but uh, it's too much pressure on her. It's too much pressure on her because her challenge in EO Sky, I don't know how fans would react to that. Her challenge in Rhea Ripley would be interesting. That would be very interesting. But Rhea Ripley is so over. Uh, unless you're going to have Jay Cargill be full-blown heel, I don't see Rhea Ripley and Jay Cargill yet. I think Jay Cargill and maybe Bianca might be a more likely scenario. You know, we had this conversation on Tuesday. Jay Cargill's first WrestleMania match. Should it be a 15-minute banger or should it be a squash? Should she just annihilate someone? You know, like, not a like a, a Zia Lee or a Nikki Cross, but really, really dominate where you're like, whoa, whoa. The problem, the only problem I have with that is if you take a really good, talented performer that's on the roster right now that has been pushed, has been a champion, and Jay, Jay just steamrolls right over that woman, I think you would get more people online like, wow, they really buried so-and-so. Instead of like, wow, Jade fucking kicked ass. No, I think people would be like, wow, they, they're burying. Wow, I can't believe they buried her like that. You know, when The Undertaker took on Jimmy Snooker in WrestleMania back then, we didn't turn around and we were like, wow, did the, the, the Undertaker dominated. No, we were like, Jimmy Snooker's old. And Jimmy Snooker used to be one of my favorites. We were like, oh, he's old. You know, he wasn't in the picture anymore. But if The Undertaker would have done that to Jimmy Snooker in 1984, then he would have been like, holy shit. Jay Cargill versus Nia Jax. I personally look psycho. I like it, but I don't think that would be fair to Jay Cargill. Because if Jay Cargill gets injured by Nia or if the match sucks, it's you have to put somebody with Jade. I think Jade Cargill and Nia Jax could have an interaction tonight in the Royal Rumble. Absolutely. But I think you got to go with someone else who is safe that the fans are behind. Even if it ends up being a heel. I think Nia Jax is scary territory. You know, I, I don't I don't know if that would be a good, not for her first match. Does Jade Cargill body slam Nia Jax tonight? I'm coming up with my own odds. All right. Before we get into Vince, one last thing that I need to get into. Mercedes Monet. The woman that was supposed to debut in AEW six times now has still not debuted. So once again, for AEW and WWE, no Monet for you. Now, I think Mercedes Monet, in the next couple of weeks, I think we will see her on TV as early as tonight or in a couple of Wednesdays from now. Um, I truly, my gut feeling, my gut feeling, this is not a prediction. This is not news. My gut feeling is that Mercedes Monet is going to go to, to AEW. Tony Khan posted a tweet earlier this week, and he said something like 2024 is the, is, is the new 2021. Like he's basically saying like what happened in, in 2021 is going to happen in 2024. And to me, that comes down to one thing, major signing, not the return of the ratings. If that motherfucker was talking about ratings when he said 2024 is the new 2021, um, he'd get crucified. I think it's a huge signing. Okada is a huge signing. I'm not questioning it. But Okada just showed up on TNA, and if I'm if I'm pretty certain he was on TNA Thursday, and he drew 102,000 viewers. This is not someone that if they show up on TV, everybody's like, change the channel, change the channel, put on access, put on access. I know access doesn't have the same number of viewers. But the rating went down. 
the rating went down. And they've had episodes on Axis that did two, 250,000 viewers. It went down. So Okada is a mega star. Not in the United States yet. Yet. I say yet. Not eat yet. So I don't think it's Okada. I think Okada could sign AEW too. Remember the template. Today, what did you see people reporting? Uh, Okada, AEW is the front runner to land Okada. Go on Google today, type in Okada News and use today as a search result. You'll see those same websites that were saying Okada, NXT, Okada, NXT. My sources say Okada, 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 WWE, Okada, Okada, Okada. Now it's AEW is a front runner. It's the same template as we said with Jay White, Will Ospreay, and others. You, we'll see. We'll see. By the way, speaking of templates, I somebody brought this to my attention. I totally forgot about it, but I'm recycling it for, for Kev and I on Monday. Uh, this is a little preview for Monday for Kevin and I. I mean, this is not going to be the overall thumbnail because Kevin and I, we're going to be talking a lot more than just Vince. Vince is going to be a very small part of the conversation. Uh, we're going to talk Raw, Velveteen Dream, Royal Rumble. We've got so many things, Dark Side of the Ring. But, you know, somebody brought to my attention back in June of 2022, I did this thumbnail. It's on YouTube. We had a big discussion in June of 2022 about how John Laurinaitis and Vince McMahon were booty men, that they were just really into the ass. Pretty wild to go back and hear that conversation. Did we know that they were freaks like we read in this uh, lawsuit? Pretty wild to go back at that. So, um, but Mercedes Monet, uh, in my opinion, she pulled a page out of her Survivor Series 2022 playbook. Do you remember Survivor Series 2022? Not this past one, 2022. Do you remember right before Survivor Series, the day before, she went online and said, something so fucking crazy is coming. Something so fucking crazy is coming. Uh, did anything happen with her at Survivor Series weekend? No. Did anything happen with her the next month or two? No. I think, what, it happened in January? But, yeah, I mean, she ended up doing something. Unfortunately, she got injured. But she did it the day before Survivor Series to have all this attention on her because it's Survivor Series. Oh, she's returning at Survivor Series. So now, yesterday, she writes... Get ready for an epic ride because 32 is about to unleash a whirlwind of adventure and fun. I think she just turned 32. Happy birthday, Mercedes. I am beyond grateful to have yet another year to chase my dreams and conquer new heights. I'm ready to rock this year and shake the table like never before. She wrote that the day before the Royal Rumble. So little teaser, when you get close to WWE pay-per-views, Go to Mercedes social media because she'll post something like that. So watch when WrestleMania comes around. Unless she's officially signed in AEW already. Hey, do not discount the possibility of Impact Wrestling bringing her in. Doubtful, long shot. But remember, TNA was teasing a lot. Like, remember they said, like, the biggest signing ever? Who is it? I mean, it's not Okada. Because they have not issued a press release that Okada is signed to TNA Wrestling for whatever it is. Who is it? It's, it's not Ash by Elegance, the Elegance, whatever, Ash by Elegance. Listen, I saw the vignette for people I'd asked. I saw the, the vignette. She, her character development looks great. My problem with Dana Brooke Ash is this, and I say this sincerely. If I buy Vienna sausages, which are kind of disgusting, but if I buy Vienna sausages and I open the container, oh, oh, ew, smells like alligator ass. Um, I'll be like, oh, disgusting, gross, ew, I don't want it. Now, it comes out with a new label, beautiful label, sexy, 
They show hot women on the commercial eating Vienna sausages very slowly, almost like, you know, all right, it looks great. The label, everything looks great. I open it up. Oh, oh, it's Vienna sausages. So you could have the vignettes in slow motion by the waterfall. You could have her brushing her hair and wearing these beautiful sunglasses, having, uh, you know, maids and drivers and whatever, chauffeurs, eating caviar, wearing mink coats. You go in the ring. <laughs> ah, it's Dana Brooke. I'm giving it with open mind. But right now, the character development is great, but it's still Dana Brooke in the ring. All right. <sighs> Let's cleanse ourselves. Let's cleanse ourselves. We got to talk about it. Um, yeah, I, I actually prefer this thumbnail. I prefer this thumbnail. Where, there we go. I'm fired. Uh, you will not hear me doing many Vince impersonations on this because this is a very serious conversation. It's gross. It's disgusting. If you are under 18, I strongly uh, insist you get your parents or your guardians permission to tune in because we're going to get into some very explicit uh, do, you will not hear me say some of the words that Vince said in the conversation, but you will see the screenshots and you will see the court documents. But uh, the countdown to Vince McMahon in the WWE and TKO is complete. Vince McMahon is no longer in the WWE. Vince McMahon is no longer in TKO Group Holdings. He is no longer chairman. He is no longer on the board of directors. I think a, a lot of people forgot that Vince was on the board of directors as well. By the way, remember I said earlier that more things are going to be coming out? Uh, remember, June 2022, Vince McMahon let go three members of the board of directors. Was that done because they were cracking down a little bit too deep of his sexual prowess? When we get into the timeline, I want you to remember June of 2022. So you do the research, you start listening, things start to fall into place, and you are left asking yourself a lot of questions. But... Late Friday night. Now, unfortunately, a lot of wrestling fans don't know how politics work and how, you know, uh, news dumps work. But in the stock market, in the political world, in business, when you have negative news, people will dump it on a late Friday. They'll do it late Friday because the weekend is coming. That is Notorious, designed. Everybody does it. But in a wrestling world, they're not used to it. Oh, that's disgusting. WWE did it, did waited until late Friday night to do it. That's horrendous. Go put on your underoos and go watch cartoons because that's how business is done. Um, late Friday, Nick Khan sent an email to WWE Breasts, and I did not forget. Uh, this super shout out from Ronnie C. I'm saving it because it's a very good question about Vince McMahon. Nick Khan sent this to staff yesterday. Quote, I wanted to inform, inform you that Vince McMahon has tendered his resignation from his positions as TKO executive chairman and on the TKO board of directors. He will no longer have a role with TKO group holdings or WWE. Within five minutes, you had all the usual suspects reporting that uh, many in WWE believe that this could open the door for a Stephanie McMahon return. They said the same shit in 2022. When I was sitting in a diner and Vince stepped down and I, just for the fuck of it, to be a dick, to show you how the sausage is made, I said, my sources tell me that, remember when Brock Lesnar walked out? Look it up. I'm the one that broke the story. After Brock Lesnar walked out before SmackDown, Vince McMahon texted Brock Lesnar and said, if you walk out of WWE, then you walk out on everything I created and you walked out on me and this is that, please do not walk out. And Brock Lesnar returned and at the very end of SmackDown, he tipped his cat up on TV and we went off the air. 
and I had no sources. I just posted that to show you how easy it is to post a story based on common sense. And yesterday, within five minutes of Nick Khan's announcement, my sources tell me that people within WWE hope that this opens up the door for a Stephanie McMahon return. Now Stephanie returns, aha, you see my sources are right. How did you like the story earlier this week that Cody Rhodes was not finishing the story of WrestleMania and Triple H doesn't do this and that? And I was shocked at the author of that story. Kevin and I are going to have fun with it on Monday. But I was like, you know what? Beautiful. I, I don't remember who was the guy that did it from Sports Illustrated. He did it. I was like, Mwah, I want to kiss you right now because it's jerk offs like those reports is what makes us even better. Makes us even, we didn't discuss it. We didn't address it. Kev didn't do it. Mish didn't do it. Kev didn't do it Thursday. I didn't do it either. And a guy, he ended up saying, my sources in the past were very reliable, but this time around, they lied. Justin Barrasso, yeah. I like Justin. But Justin, sometimes when a source gives you something that looks like shit, smells like shit, tastes like shit, and just seems really, really weird, you don't just post it and then use, well, my sources gave me this. No, you have to use a little fucking common sense and say, ah, this goes against like two years of storyline. Like, why would they do that? No, it's because everybody just runs my motto since 1997. I don't want to be first. I want to be right. So I need these people to do this because it just shows when Kevin and I do our thing that we do not make mistakes. And if something seems a little too far-fetched, we'll research, we'll ask questions, or we'll wait until we have the answer. And then we put it out there. And 99.9% .9 of the time, we're right. That's why everybody hates what we do because we're right. So, all right, last chance, everybody, last chance. If you want to download the QR code, you know, for the PDF of the lawsuit, because we're going to get into a bunch of accusations and they're pretty wild. And trust me, I got all the screenshots waiting. I got all the screenshots waiting. Yeah. Vince has a fascination of, uh, oh, I don't even want I, not yet, not yet. I'm going to need to take a shower early if that's the case. Um, Vince McMahon resigned late Friday night. Vince McMahon denies the allegations. This is Vince's statement, and I quote, I stand by my prior statement that Ms. Grant's lawsuit is replete with lies, obscene, made-up instance, instances that never occurred, and is a vindictive distortion of the truth. I intend to vigorously defend myself against these baseless accusations and look forward to cleaning, clearing my name. However, out of respect for the WWE Universe, the extraordinary TKO business and its board members and shareholders, partners and constituents, and all of the employees and superstars who helped make WWE into the global leader it is today, I have decided to resign from my executive chairmanship and the TKO board of directors effective immediately. So Vince is officially out. Now, it's very important to look at the quote where he says, a vindictive distortion of the truth. Out of his entire denial, those words fascinate me the most because I tru truly believe Vince was a freak and he found someone who was sexually, you know, uh, I don't know how you want to call it, curious, kinky. He found the, the fantasy that some people out there want. It's it telling you, as we go this, through this lawsuit, it's like a Lifetime movie meets Rob Black. It, that's what it, it's just, it, you, as it goes on, you just picture, picture this woman. And I'm not, listen, I am not throwing shade at Janelle Grant. That's her name. And, oh, very important. I got to put this out there immediately. Not here, 
not on the Don Tony and Kevin Castle show, are we showing a picture of her? That, to me, is inappropriate. Kev thinks it's disrespectful. Even if she's vindictive, even if she was a willing participant, but once she got fired and got a little bit manipulated and threatened that if she didn't keep doing what she was doing, she was going to be out of a job, no matter what the outcome is, I don't think it's appropriate that we put pictures of her out there. So we're not posting pictures of her. If you want to look it up, you can look it up. If you see a picture of her, you know, like I said, it, it feels like a bad lifetime movie where, you know, she's home and she has to take care of her sick parents and she doesn't have a job and all the walls are crumbling in and somebody in a building says, listen, I know Vince McMahon, WWE, you know, you, you could, I could put in a good word for you. Oh, can you please? And then Vince meets with her and she's like, oh, you know, we had a great meeting. Here's my resume. Here's thank you cookies. And here's this. It comes off like a bad, like nine and a half weeks or, you know, East meets West or Eyes Wide Shut, whatever it is. It's like one of those movies where the innocent girl and the older, rich billionaire boss starts seducing her. Yeah. That feels good. And I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm just saying, like, if you hear this go along, it sounds like a bad Lifetime movie. Where were all the supporters? Where were the friends? Where was her, you know, and I'm not blaming it on her, but a simple Google search or your friends, whoever put in a good work. Listen, girl, I could get you good word for Vince McMahon and WWE, but you know, you gotta be careful about that guy. Where's all our friends early on? Look, he invited me to my condo. Bad idea, girl. Do you know about his history? None of that. None of that. So I think this that she was groomed, absolutely. But as we go along, you will start to see a little pattern. And then I think the most important thing is why are other people not in this lawsuit? There's rumors that Kevin Dunn is in on this, and I'll explain why in a minute. Some people think Brock Lesnar, which honestly he didn't do anything wrong, if you read it. I mean, and people want to psychoanalyze his marriage with Sable, which is just goofy. But you go start hearing about executives, referees, other clients, people that work there, and they're all sexually abusing her. None of them are sued. And I think there's a reason why. And I'm going to share with you momentarily. Now, as we get to the screenshots of Vince's text messages, I will refer to the particular number of where this is in the lawsuit so you could reference it. Uh, before I do that, I definitely want to answer this. And this is from Ronnie C. Happy Royal Rumble, everyone. DT, one question about Vince. If he is cleared of these accusations, does he ever return to the WWE? Fifty Shades of Grey. That's a good one, Ray. Fifty Shades of Grey. My answer to Ronnie, even if Vince McMahon is cleared of trafficking, a cleared of assault, the only time Vince comes back to the WWE is when he is, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but hear me out, it's when he is on his deathbed, when he is like almost crippled, where he looks fragile, that I don't even think he would know, you know, what a dildo is, or he would use it as some type of device to help him get up. You know, like, let me hold on to that. Like Vince would be, have to be so old and so fragile and so deteriorated that I think just out of, you know, everything he's done for wrestling, you know, look, yeah, Vince, horrible man, disgusting, you abused his power, sex addict, you know, weird fetishes as he got older. You know, it's more about domination, you know, uh, but now he's 90 and he can't move and he's close to death. And uh, Look at Ric Flair. Look at Ric Flair. I'm not trying to compare Vince McMahon with Ric Flair, but if you listen closely to podcasts from legendary promoters, wrestlers, managers, and they talk about the 80s, and they talk about some weird, wild parties that these guys would have. Why, just because you did it in the 80s and you didn't do it in the 2010s makes it any better? 
you know, it's people just because time goes by, people just let it go or forget about it. You know, a lot of people in wrestling have some very, very perverted things about themselves. Do you remember the story I told a couple of weeks ago when I started doing some work for XPW and went over my friend's house? Remember the story? He, he's like, hey, do you know who so-and-so is and so-and-so is? Because they had some women that worked for the company that were in the adult entertainment business. I'm like, no, 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 I never heard. Oh, here's a couple of movies. And I typed in a movie. And what did I say a couple of weeks ago? I see somebody getting peed on, crapped on. And I was like, the fuck am I watching here? And I threw it in the garbage. That's not my style. I mean, I don't want to look at the person and be like, wow, you look clean today. You know, it's just disgusting. It's not my style. But for people to think that there isn't some weird fetish out there, uh, you, you, there's a dark world. It, it's in the world of sex uh, and power that I don't think any of us would ever be able to understand. But if Vince is cleared of the worst allegations, that's the only way he comes back. He cannot ever come back to the board. He could not ever come back other in, in, in WWE management. Why? Because of what I said at the very beginning. Just because you didn't do something illegal doesn't mean that your behavior is not reprehensible. Vince McMahon's behavior was reprehensible and is not acceptable. His conduct is not acceptable in the publicly traded world of TKO Group Holdings, World Wrestling Entertainment, or any other business out there. Remember his statement. Obscene, made-up instances, and a vindictive distortion of the truth. Vince is admitting that some of what is in this lawsuit is true, but distorted, distorted. What could that mean? She wanted it. She liked it. She was into it. She, she enjoyed it. That's what's going to come out on this lawsuit. So you're going to realize that a lot of what happened, she very well could have been a willing participant of. Doesn't mean Vince should still be brought back. That is disgusting. It is unprofessional. It is misconduct. And then you start looking at board members who were, who were removed from the board of directors. And then you see, you know, NDAs and all this other stuff. Listen, uh, let me let me say it as point blank. I know a lot of you out there don't know didn't know much about NDAs until Vince, Jericho, Tony Khan, AEW, but in billionaire companies, NDAs happen a lot. NDAs happen more than you can imagine. You want to sweep something under the rug? You're a basketball player and somebody's accusing you of, you know, uh, grabbing their ass in a nightclub. Even if you didn't do it, this fucking, I never did that. I wasn't even at the club. Now, if you really, really, really want to fight it, no problem. But now it becomes public record. Even if you clear yourself 10, 20 years from now, oh, yeah, you remember the time? If you ever do something wrong, oh, you know what? I bet you that time when he was in the club, he actually did grab that woman's ass. So what do you do? A little under the table here. Here's $10,000. Sign this non-disclosure agreement. Never bring this up walk away. When you're a billionaire, 10 over, and somebody accuses you of something, it is easier to say, what do we have to give her to shut the fuck up and move on? For people that think that Tony Khan or WWE or the political world or entertainment world, the basketball world, that NDAs are just as, a lot of times people do do these NDAs to just, you know, avoid a headache, even if it's not true. When you have billionaires, sometimes it's like, you know what? Fuck that person. That person's just trying to uh, uh, get a money grab on me. That person's trying to squeeze me. But it might be cheaper, easier, and better publicity if no one ever knew about it. So there are people out there that do that. I used to tell a story that my ex's mom, Back in the 90s, 2000s, well, 90s especially, late 90s, 
she would accuse McDonald's of putting a nail in a Big Mac. She would accuse of having a piece of glass in a in a, a, a on a local food truck. She would write all these letters to all of these places saying that that she got you know almost ate this or you know bid on it just to try to squeeze them for money. And I don't think she ever succeeded. And you know if she did that these days, she'd be in jail. But, you know, hey, listen, any way I can make a buck, let me accuse that person of something and maybe I can make some money out of it. Everybody thinks that simply because someone has a vagina doesn't mean that there's ill intentions. And does that have anything to do with Janelle Grant? No, no. I don't think there's any ill intentions here. I don't think she lied about any of this. But I think if, after reading this lawsuit, it seems like someone who was manipulated, taken advantage of, was into a lot of this, and then it got out of control. It got out of control. But again, I ask you, as we go on, why are other people not named in this lawsuit? If a referee, if other executives, if other employees did these same things, along with John Laurinaitis and Vince McMahon, why are they not named? Why? Because you don't have a text message? That's what it comes down to. As you see these text messages, you will realize right away that because John Laurinaitis is the only person mentioned in the text messages alleged to have been typed by Vince, she's only going after John Laurinaitis. That is the only reason why Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis are the only two people named in this lawsuit, because this lawsuit is based on text messages. And the text messages are led to bigger stories. Again, do, did he commit trafficking? I don't know. Did he commit sexual assault? I don't know. I don't know how much of it was willing and how much of it wasn't. I am convinced, though, that Vince McMahon definitely abused his power, became an addict. And then it just turned into a horrible, low-budget porn film. It's literally a lifetime movie, an X-rated version of it. All right, let's get into it. No more, no more hyping. All right, you don't have to look at your screen because I know there's a lot of you out there that have phones. But I'm putting this out there for those that watch it on their TVs, watch it on their monitors. I will get into things here, I'm not going to read everything, but I'm going to read the items that are the most important. And the first thing I want to bring up is the parties. The parties is starts with number 34. And this, you have to remember when you start thinking, could it be Kevin Dunn? Some people think it could be Triple H. Some people think it could be, you know, somebody else. All right. You have the plaintiff, Janelle Grant obviously. Connecticut citizen, former employee of WWE from June of 2019 to March of 2022. She was there three years. Defendant, Vince McMahon. You know his bio. Defendant, World Wrestling Entertainment. Defendant, John Laurinaitis. Now it says non-party officials slash employees of WWE. They do not name the person. Instead, they name the person WWE Corporate Officer Number 2. So when we go into this lawsuit a little bit further, when I say Number 2, I don't mean Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter, Number 2. No, I mean Corporate Officer Number 2. They do not name Corporate Officer Number 2. Why would you not name Corporate Officer Number 2? But as we go through it, you'll ask yourself that question. At all times relevant, WWE corporate officer number two was a high-ranking employee at WWE who made hiring decisions, conducted prospective employee interviews, and maintained significant control over personnel decisions. WWE corporate officer number two worked in these capacities during Mr. Gra Ms. Grant's employment in the WWE. This individual is referred herein as corporate officer number two. This is not John Laurinaitis. John Laurinaitis has already been named. This is somebody else who else was involved in hiring. Who's the guy that was let go 
Who's the guy that would let go? Remember, he was on Total Divas. What was the guy that used to be in WWE that was let go? That a lot of, he would always have interactions with the Divas. Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank right now. Someone in the chat will know exactly what I'm talking about. He was always featured, but he might have been gone before 2019. Um, Mark Carano, thank you, Drew H. Could someone go on Google and find out the date that Mark Carano left WWE? But again, if this is Mark Carano, why is Mark Carano not named in this lawsuit? Why would you go with corporate officer number two, especially when you start hearing what number two actually did? Uh, I appreciate someone's checking right now. So, okay. Now we go to corporate officer number three. At all times relevant, WWE corporate officer number three was a high-ranking employee and board member, board member, uh, during Miss Grant's employment with WWE. This individual is referred to as corporate officer number three. He was fired in 2021, so he fits right into this timeline. So Mark Carano could very well, did you hear anybody on the net in the last 12 hours bring up Mark Carano? I don't think so. So it could be him. But again, you have Vince, John Laranitis, and they mention corporate officer number two and corporate officer number three. And finally, we got one more. Corporate officer number four is a high-ranking employee at WWE who worked with the legal affairs at the company. Corporate officer number four held that position from the time Miss Grant's initial employment with WWE until sometime in 2020. This individual will be referred as corporate officer number four. I guess if we look at whoever was let go in 2020, we might have an idea. Now, remember, people were let go because of COVID, not because of this. So you have to keep that in mind. Then they get to WWE Superstar. And once we finish this part, then we could get into the meat and potatoes and everything. WWE Superstar is a professional wrestling superstar who performs at WWE's branded wrestling events. During the time of Miss Grant's employment, McMahon signed WWE Superstar to a booking contract with WWE. This individual, guys, individual, is referred to as WWE Superstar. This is the person that a lot of people think is Brock Lesnar. Okay, I just want to make that clear. I felt bad for Matt Riddle because Matt Riddle uh, was being uh, singled out, which I thought was terrible. Uh, be when we get into it a little bit later, when you see UFC champion and everything like that. Now, I know you could see that I have highlighted areas, but I'm skipping through this for a particular reason. Because remember, this is 67 pages long, but the first part is kind of okay. So we'll we'll go back. We'll go back and we'll start breaking this down. All right. So we can, we're pretty much ready to go. I'm just lining this up. So anybody that's looking at this on the screen can see it. All right. So we're going to go to WWE Superstar. Okay. Parties. All right. So here we go. Factual allegations. Miss Grant's introduction to McMahon turns into a two-hour meeting between the potential entry-level employee and a billionaire CEO. Prior to having any involvement with WWE, Miss Grant was dealing with personal issues. After her family passed away, Miss uh, Grant dedicated herself to finding gainful employment. During this time, Mrs. Miss Grant often ran into McMahon's two personal assistants in her building, one of whom was a former grade school classmate of Ms. Grant. Ms. Grant's closest friend in the building was the resident manager. That individual is referred to as resident manager. Similar in personality, Ms. Grant and the resident manager bonded over stories of adversity as they could coordinate community initiatives in the building together. Resident manager was aware of Ms. Grant's efforts to obtain employment. In March of 2019, Ms. Grant remained unsuccessful in securing long-term employment. Resident manager offered to help Ms. Grant 
suggesting she could reach out to Defendant McMahon in case he could exist, ex, uh, assist and text him to see if he would be willing to speak with Miss Grant to provide advice about employment. Now, one thing I find very interesting right off the bat, guys, this resident manager had Vince McMahon on text. That I find fascinating because... You think Vince just gives out his cell number to everybody? So why did this resident manager have his number? Anyway, McMahon responded enthusiastically and proposed times to meet with Miss Grant to discuss employment. Resident manager passed along Miss Grant's resume to McMahon uh, ahead of the prospective meeting. Ahead of the meeting, resident manager advised Miss Grant to be energetic as McMahon is big on energy and talk to McMahon no differently than she talks to the resident manager. All right, so now, for those watching the video, I highlighted things that you definitely should remember. So now we go to the timeline. On or about March 23rd of 2019, Ms. Grant arrived for the meeting in McMahon's condo with additional printed copies of her resume, a black notepad, and thank you cookies. Sitting at his dining table, McMahon looked at Ms. Grant's resume and complimented both her communication skills and common sense before discussing little but their personal lives. For example, Ms. Grant told McMahon about the hardship that led to resident manager's offer to help and described losing her parents, her family's bankruptcy, and trauma that led to her seek financial independence to ensure she would never experience losing her home again. Now, remember, everyone, she signed for 75 grand. This, when you're talking about financial independence and saving your home in 2020 or 2019's economy, I don't know if 75,000 cuts it. But again, why do you meet him in the condo? To, again, sounds like a bad lifetime movie. McMahon shared stories about his upbringing, his traumatic childhood, growing up in poverty and current family dynamics, including his separation from Linda McMahon, described as his ex and long gone. He added his marital sta status as an arrangement on paper for business purposes and that he lives in a quiet, isolated existence outside of the WWE. At the end of the meeting, McMahon told Miss Grant that he didn't just want to give her a job, but give her a life, that he would find a place for her at WWE. Stunned. Miss Grant said she didn't know how to thank him for possibly just changing his life. McMahon responded in what, that one simple thank you is enough, that he would accept the hug. They stood and embraced. McMahon then told Mrs. Grant, Miss Grant, that he'd get the ball rolling on the next steps, but it was a busy time of year as WWE was preparing for WrestleMania, explaining that it was WWE Super Bowl. He then invited Miss Grant to attend as his guest, along with resident manager, and added that he would personally select their seats to have the best possible experience. McMahon advised that his office would reach out to her to set up a meeting with a trusted official, WWE corporate officer number two, at WWE headquarters. After asking if her cell was the best number to reach her, McMahon shared his personal phone number with Miss Grant, walked her to the door, and hugged her again, whispering, so good. Yes, that's, that's the story. Now, we move on. We move on. And there's one moment during another meeting, McMahon described the surgery he had on his knee by touching Miss Grant's leg and drawing a line where the surgery had taken place with his finger. He stated that, similar to rehabbing an injury, Miss Grant cannot let scar tissue build up inside her from trauma as her vulnerability is a gift. McMahon explained that people are intimidated around him and are afraid to touch him. McMahon added that he is an affectionate person who likes to hug and starves for physical affection. Wow, this kind of sounds like Joey Ryan. McMahon had led Miss Grant on a tour of his condo before hugging her goodbye, again whispering, Feel so good. On April 1st, 2019, Miss Grant met with Corporate Officer Number 2 at WWE headquarters for a short time. Number 2 hardly asked any questions, saying that 
Number two was figuring out where Miss Grant would be placed and promised to be in touch with her after WrestleMania. Later that day, Miss Grant texted McMahon and enthusiastically described a meeting with corporate officer number two. She also com commented on a dinosaur skull that she saw in McMahon's office wall, prompting his response, by the way, if you're a bad girl, the T-Rex will eat you up. Followed by, seriously, Janelle, wherever you land in the WWE, you'll be a credit to your, the organization. They go on to talk about being a VIP guest at WrestleMania. But here's where it gets to the next level. Number 65. Over the next several weeks, McMahon invited Miss Grant to his condo on several occasions, each time assuring her that he would find the right position for her at WWE. Again, guys, from the beginning, Instead of going to the corporate offices, she keeps going to the guy's condo. For each meeting with Mr. McMahon, Ms. Grant bought, brought sample, sample job descriptions she found online to review with him and demonstrate the types of roles she might fit in. McMahon listened to Ms. Grant, asked her questions, and pointed out qualities that described as rare gifts, including her goodness, vivaciousness, childlike innocence, and ability to be vulnerable, all things that made her an easy target. McMahon also initiated long physical embraces with Miss Grant, repeatedly telling her that he trusted her, that he could be himself around her, and how he'd opened his home to her. Number 67, during one visit to the condo in late April of 2019, McMahon did not greet Miss Grant when she entered, but instead called her to his master walk-in closet. As soon as she turned the corner, McMahon emerged from his bedroom wearing only briefs. Shocked, Miss Grant turned around and apologized as McMahon laughed and asked her to turn around. He then handed her a shirt and asked for help with the buttons. McMahon reminded her that he was working hard on her role and said she felt good about her taking Care, he felt good about taking care of him. Around that time, McMahon also told Miss Grant that he would never forget how helpless she looked when they first met, that they wanted he wanted to wrap his arms around her and ensured her that everything is going to be okay, that Miss Grant's problems were in the past. McMahon also told Miss Grant that he viewed her as a true friend. You see where this is going, right, guys? On April 21st, 2019, this is number 70. Now we get to the juicy stuff, if you even call it that. McMahon unexpectedly invited Miss Grant to his condo to provide her with an update. Upon her arrival, arrival McMahon assured her that Miss Grant, that he was a man of his word, that his office would be in touch with her soon with the right role. As she turned to leave, McMahon grabbed a large black electric massager and told Miss Grant to turn around for a demonstration. He quickly moved to rubbing his hands on Miss Grant's upper back before reminding her that he would hear from his she would hear from his office about the next steps in a day or two. Let me just add something to this, guys. She's now, this is two months in. This is a bad lifetime movie. Two months in, no job repeated visits to Vince's condo, show, wearing no, nothing but briefs, hugging, feels so good. I'm not saying she deserved any type of abuse or assault, but any smart-minded person at this point, two months in, going to an old man's condo, giving hugs, keep telling her, don't worry, next week. Don't worry, next week. No, 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 I promise. Your days are behind you. Uh, what ha would she do with the mortgage company, with all the bills for these two months? Don't worry. It'll be taken care of. Number 72. On May 5th, 2019, Miss Graham visited McMahon's condo again, and the topic of bucket list came up, to which Miss Graham expressed that she always dreamed of attending the Belmont Stakes. McMahon responded that he would personally acquire two tickets for her, which Miss Grant said she could not accept. McMahon then stood up from his chair, 
knelt knelt in front of the chair where Miss Grant was seated, blocking her from standing. He leaned close and told her to kiss him. Miss Grant passed, paused, and gave McMahon a kiss on the cheek, in which Miss Mr. McMahon sighed, that's not what I meant. After McMahon walked off to his bedroom and said that he wanted Miss Grant, she swiftly rejected his advances and tried to reason with him that he was putting her in a bad position. Miss Grant pied, uh, pled with McMahon and stopped and thought about what she was doing. McMahon then begged repeatedly simply to hold Miss Grant. Out of fear for her employment, and his earlier implied threats about his legal team dealing with problems, Miss Grant laid down in bed next to McMahon and kept her hands clapped, clasped and her ankles crossed as she acquiesced in saying that he could only hold her, but nothing more. When Miss Grant tried to make small talk about WWE's TV storylines, McMahon suggested that she watch the next episode of Monday Night Raw and text him before the broadcast. After she agreed, he forcibly kissed her and began pulling down a strap on her sweater. Miss Grant then sat up. She said she needed to leave. This was a lot to process and left. The next day, Miss Grant watched the show as promised and texted McMahon to wish him well. She was shocked when he appeared on the show and texted back in the middle of the live broadcast. That was a nice massage. Made me smile. On May 9th, 2019, McMahon texted Miss Grant that she would oh, she will have a job at WWE by that Friday. My friends, we are now in fucking May. This is over two months. Number 80, the next day, Human Resources employee number two called Miss Grant to inform her that WWE corporate officer number four would contact her by 4 p.m. to discuss a legal role. After her call with WWE corporate officer number four, Miss Grant sent McMahon a thumbs-up text message to indicate the call went well. Around 7 o'clock, number four unexpectedly called her a second time, formally offered her a job, and said, Welcome to the WWE. On May 11th, McMahon invited Miss Grant to his condo again and asked her to lay in bed with him before informing her that he had ordered uh, number four to offer her a job, even though the job description had not been firmed up beyond a high-level summary. While incredibly excited to finally receive long-awaited employment and financial security, 75 grand, everyone, Ms. Grant expressed to McMahon that there seemed to be a conflict between his doing this and wanting Ms. Grant that no one could know about their closeness. He appeared amused with this by saying, it's my company. McMahon then undressed uh, down to his briefs while Miss Grant remained clothed and began kissing Miss Grant and inserting his hands into her pants without consent. On May 16th, 2019, McMahon informed Miss Grant that he obtained two tickets to the Belmont sweepstakes scheduled for June 8th. On May 17th, she writing a diary. On May 17th, Miss Grant received an offer letter from WWE for an entry-level job as legal administrative coordinator with a salary of $75,000. On May 18th, McMahon summoned Miss Grant to his condo and she bought it, brought a printed copy of the offer letter to review with him. McMahon informed Miss Grant that her new boss, a WWE employee who worked in risk and government relations, uh, herein referred as employee number one, was a decades-long family friend and confidant, similar in age to McMahon, and one of a small original group who helped the WWE expand from a regional promotion to a glo global juggernaut. McMahon stated that outside of his attorney, WWE employee number one was the most feared figure in the company because number one usually fired employees. Beyond that, he offered little detail about employee one's role at WWE. Instead, he focused on employee one's personal traumas, explaining that similar to Miss Grant, employee one had no family left after employee one's spouse passed away and that the McMahons and WWE were employee one's surrogate family. McMahon touted employee one's loyalty, saying that number one would also be able to protect Miss Grant 
and led her to his bedroom while giving her the command of, please don't stop this. During the May 18, 2019 encounter, Ms. Grant felt coerced into engaging in sexual activity and that McMahon had trapped her to an impossible situation and she feared adverse career and personal consequences and legal retaliation if she declined his advances. McMahon stated, this is what I've been waiting for as he performed oral sex on Miss Grant. Warning, guys, here's your point of no return. We start getting into wrestler named dildos, feces, and some awful behavior. Here's your last warning. Feeling that she was being used for his gratification, Miss Grant went numb, was unable to make eye contact. McMahon then flipped on his back and said, okay, jack him off. Disturbed by the non-sensual non sexual encounter, she hoped that McMahon would cease his advances, but his advances continued and left her to fulfill his demands or lose her job. On June 16, 2019, the day before starting with WWE, Ms. Grant attempted to shut down any further physical contact or sexual encounters by admitting to Mr. McMahon that unhappiness and concern started her first ever job in the legal department, no less with a physical relationship with the chairman and CEO. She requested that any physical relationship while remaining friends to avoid any risks to either one of them. McMahon refused by saying it was not ending. It didn't need to that he did not ever envision it ending. He reminded that he trusted her, reiterated that rumors would lead to trouble, uh, probed whether her silence would be an issue, and brushed off her concerns that she was struggling with the feeling that her job felt unearned. McMahon told Miss Grant that all she needed to do is not tell anyone, that it just had to look legit. On June, 9, June 17, 2019, Ms. Grant reported to WWE headquarters for her first day at work, after all it is, everybody, with attorneys in glass offices and support staff in cubicles with low walls and tall monitors, it was easy to see how much other colleagues worked as a quiet and small department. It was even easy to overhear their conversations. Number 99, WWE employee number one and Ms. Grant bonded as quickly as McMahon had predicted, Ms. Grant, referred to as partner, was taught words to live by in the WWE, including, we do what is best for business, best interests of the company, protect the business. And if McMahon wants something, the answer isn't no, but rather, how do we make it happen? Employee one also impressed that Ms. Grant, uh, on Ms. Grant, that her job titles don't mean anything for members of McMahon's inner circle which she was clearly considered to be a part of. All right, here's where it gets starts getting disgusting. Beginning in July of 2019, after Ms. Grant raised an issue related to XFL's performance-enhancing drug policy with McMahon, WWE Corporate Officer Number Four's behavior shifted from cold to hostile. If Ms. Grant walked into a room while WWE Corporate Officer 4, he was laughing with colleagues, Corporate Officer Number 4's expression immediately became blank and 4 would walk away. If Officer 4 and Ms. Grant walked towards each other in the hallway, Officer 4 stopped and changed direction. Notwithstanding the issues detailed above, Ms. Grant took her appointment seriously. In contrast, McMahon continued a pattern of sending sexually charged messages throughout the work week. Certain her employment depended on her continued appeasement of and obedience to McMahon and believing that she needed McMahon's protection from the suspicious corporate officer number four and others. Ms. Grant felt no choice but respond in kind. McMahon was adamant for having Ms. Grant send him explicit photographs, impressing upon her that it was part of her sexuality. Given the control that McMahon had over Ms. Grant's employment, she felt compelled to comply and sent the sexually explicit photographs to McMahon's mobile device. Ms. Grant was routinely assured that the photos 
she was providing to McMahon was to remain private and were part of their secret world. McMahon began to degrade Miss Grant, calling her his bitch, while hinting at a fascination with having other people watch them engage in sexual activity. Number 109. Additionally, this complaint details encounters to which McMahon caused Miss Grant to sustain physical injuries, including bleeding and pain from forceful use of sex toys, despite Miss Grant's plea to cease any further sexual activity. The number of sexual encounters increased, as did McMahon's physical aggression, aggression during them. The rest of this, my friends, is disgusting. Salacious, but definitely continues painting the picture. I think we all kind of see where this, this is going. Notably, McMahon was most aggressive when using the certain sex toys named after male WWE wrestlers and performers. McMahon used the sex toys, named the sex toys, so that the color of the toy matched the race of the wrestler. For example, a black dildo would be named after a African-American wrestler, and a white dildo would be named after a white Caucasian wrestler. In addition to McMahon's infatuation with pretending that other men, and namely certain WWE talent, were in the room with them, this was yet another incremental step in desensitizing Miss Grant to his fantasy and eventual demands that she perform sexual acts for and have sexual contact with others within WWE. If you have video, everyone, you definitely want to look at your screen in a moment. During a David versus Goliath type wrestling match in 2019, Miss Grant shared with McMahon her thoughts on the event, the draw of rooting for the underdog and ideas for future events. McMahon complimented her for her creative input. She believed that she was being taken seriously. That is, until McMahon named the dildo after the smaller wrestler and attempted to sexualize the situation, diminishing her input. Can you guess what match she was talking about? For those not on video, Kofi Kingston and Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar won the WWE Championship. Okay, we continue. Number 119. She, I get, okay, here we go. She starts having mental issues. So on November 20th, 2019, McMahon insisted that Miss Grant see a physician of his choosing. This physician is referred to as celebrity doctor. And the facility that celebrity doctor performed was referred to as alternative clinic. McMahon and celebrity doctor uh, assured Grant that her bills at the alternative clinic would be taken care of on the McMahon's account. After the initial visit, it became apparent to the doctor's practice and Ms. Grant's felt pressured to do so. Celebrity doctor made comments about how celebrity doctor had saved her life and celebrity doctor offered remarked how Ms. Grant was unable to even make eye contact with Celebrity Doctor during their initial sessions, obvious signs of trauma. Ms. Grant acknowledged having a relationship with Mr. McMahon during visits with Celebrity Doctor, who gave little reaction, uh, telling her that there were many different paths to God and love. Celebrity Doctor lavished attention, treatments, and products on Ms. Grant, all of which were paid for on the Mr. McMahon's account. Ms. Grant was never provided with any receipts. When Ms. Grant inquired about certain treatments provided, Celebrity Doctor challenged her on whether she trusted Celebrity Doctor and postured that if she didn't trust Celebrity Doctor, then we should part ways right now. I got to stop for a second, everybody. I got to stop for a second. Even if she didn't get receipts, Doctor is a medical professional, licensed. He's not a voodoo doctor. How does this lawyer not go and solicit the treatments? 
There's got to be documentation of it, right? Just because the doctor doesn't give you a receipt doesn't mean there's no receipt existed. Why is this doctor not part of this lawsuit? Why is corporate officer number one, two, three, and four not part of this lawsuit? Why are they not named? Again, when you start seeing screenshots of the text messages, I think it becomes apparent. There's no proof. It's he said, she said. She could accuse 900 people assaulting her. If she starts throwing names out there, she could be sued. Her only defense are the text messages, and the text messages only show Vince and show John Laurinaitis. How come the text messages do not talk about celebrity doctor? How come the text messages do not talk about the other corporate officers? How come the text messages only talk about some specific sexual encounters? Why is that not exhibits? Again, I'm not saying that this girl did anything wrong. All I'm saying is, is as you go through this, this comes across as nine and a half weeks, eyes wide shut, Caligula, you know, it's, this is what it looks like. A naive woman, you know, who's going, and I, and if you ever watched the Lifetime movie, could you picture it? For the first three months, she's not even hired. She's going out for coffee with her girlfriend. So how did it go? Oh, I'm going to McMahon's condo this weekend. Girl, why are you going to his condo? Do you ever see what this guy, you, oh, no, I know what I'm doing. No, 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 no. He, it's not, he's not like that. Is You could see exactly where this is going. For $75,000. $75,000. Okay. Number 121. On January 30th, 2020. Now, keep in mind, this is almost a year that she started talking to McMahon. WWE issued a press release announcing that the company's co-presidents, George Badios and Michelle Wilson, were departing the company, and she they would no longer serve as the board of directors. A significant drop in WWE stock price followed. The company announced that Frank Riddick III a member of the board of directors for more than 11 years would serve as interim chief financial officer and report directly to McMahon. On February 3rd, 2020, McMahon sent a message to Ms. Grant advising that he had been informed by corporate officer number two. There were a lot of rumors circulating about Ms. Grant and Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon warned Ms. Grant that rumors were not good for either of them. Then on February 10th, 2020, without any advance warning, Ms. Grant was temporarily relocated to the XFL workforce. On March 26, 2020, McMahon sent a lengthy message to Ms. Grant describing in detail the circumstances surrounding sharing explicit photographs of Ms. Grant to a former WWE referee, referred to herein as referee. McMahon described how WWE referee left to masturbate and told Ms. Grant that she had made a perfect stranger just happy, very happy. Ms. Grant initially dismissed this as more fantasy talk, believing that McMahon would not actually do such a reckless thing. But when she voiced apprehension about McMahon showing naked photos of her with someone that she did not know, McMahon's response was not to comfort her, but to assure her that WWE's referees' loyalty to him. The sharing of explicit photos terrified Miss Grant as it illustrated McMahon's sheer lack of self-control, and it further panicked her that these private and intimate photos, which include her face, were being shared with, with complete strangers. On March 30th, 2020, McMahon enthusiastically messaged Miss Grant that WWE referee had showed a friend a naked photo of Miss Grant, which marked the beginning of McMahon showing Miss Grant's naked photos with others who he encouraged to share with their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. In May of 2020, McMahon had recruited an individual whom he manipul manipulatively referred to as his friend to engage in a threesome with McMahon and Miss Grant. The friend turned out to be Vince McMahon's physical therapist at an alternative clinic 
which referred to as physical therapist. To induce Miss Grant's participation in the threesome, McMahon began referring to Miss Grant as his girlfriend and sent her a large bouquet of flowers. Nevertheless, on May 8, 2020, Miss Grant expressed apprehension about participating in the threesome. In response, McMahon insisted that the plans were already made and suggested he would lose a friendship if she did not go through with it. On the day of the threesome, on May 9, 2020, Miss Grant showed up at the condo but reiterated that she did not want to go through with the act, but she showed up everyone. anyway, everyone. She expressed fear of being thrown around like a rag doll by McMahon and the physical therapist. After Miss Grant clearly stated that she wanted to back out, McMahon responded by telling Miss Grant for the first time that he loved her, stunning her into silence. McMahon's manipulation tactic resulted in the outcome he wanted, and he had her down the stairs in the bedroom where physical therapist was already waiting to begin the threesome. Early in the encounter, McMahon immediately directed Miss Grant to lay down on her back in a supplicating position. While straddling over her, Mr. McMahon defecated on Miss Grant's head. McMahon left to shower off, but he instructed Miss Grant to remain in place with excrement in her hair and continued performing for his friend. While Miss Grant requested protection, none was offered. McMahon and physical therapist actively continued with the threesome and following the threesome on May 11th, 2020, McMahon sent an explicit text message to Miss Grant that further detailed his fantasies seeing her engaged in sexual relations. Here's the first text message screenshot. Vince says in his text message, I love it. That's you, Janelle. You just can't get enough, can you? Can I just say one thing before we go any further, everyone? As you look at these text messages, do you think Vince types or do you think Vince talks into his phone? I think this is very, very important because these text messages are not voice texts because the phone would not automatically capitalize the word come um, I don't think it would misspell pussy. I don't think, do, do you pitch up Vince typing all of this? That's the thing that I find a little strange with this, but all right. Not saying that they're not true, but anyway, here's the first screenshot text message. I love it. That's you, Janelle. You just can't get enough, can you? In the future, uh, it's going to be so bad that you'll demand to be fucked twice a day and not just with, and she censors it in a three-way. Why not let others see the beautiful, voluptuous body and watch you shake uncontrollably when you come? They'll go out of their minds. Then I'll find more friends and we'll tie you up so you're helpless. I'll direct them to have their way with you in any way they want. Maybe you could scream the loudest. Maybe I'll just line them up and have them squirt in your mouth. Or... Your, her uh, pussy all over her tits and ass all the same th time. You'll be covered in cum and we'll make you eat it all and taste everybody's cum. The next morning you'll be at a little store, but you'll still going to want more. After that, screwing over and over. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot more, everyone. McMahon then pressured Miss Grant to set several additional threesomes in large part because she felt she had no other choice, particularly after McMahon's comments that he had personally ensured that she had not lost her job. Her subsequent run-ins with physical therapists at Alternative Clinic also served as a reminder of how much was at stake, at stake if she did not obey. McMahon controlled Miss Grant's employment, income, paid for her medical care, circulated naked pictures of her and ignored her lack of con concern for her first threesome. My friends, again, we're the only people that are going to point these things out, but why is physical therapist not in this lawsuit? Why is the alternative clinic not in this lawsuit? We didn't even get to others 
We didn't get to John Laurinaitis yet, but we're going to start speeding this up a little bit because, you know, can't spend hours on this. Okay, after the threesomes began, Mr. McMahon became more and more sadistic with his fantasies focused on control such as choking, sensory deprivation, pain, humiliation, and group scenarios in which Miss Grant was to be physically overwhelmed and subservient. I think that's how you say it. Here's another screenshot. Regarding your last picture, you need your panties ripped off and your three and three big black penises. I, I think I'm gonna just well, whatever. You see it. In all three holes at the same time. Way up your pussy and way up your ass as far as they go, but even farther. And the thickest one goes down your throat, so it makes you gag and convulse as those big black dicks, cocks, pound away as it feels like from the start. You're being assaulted, but it makes you come nonstop. My friends, I'm an adult. Even me reading this is kind of uncomfortable. Um, as you lay on your stomach, the cum is coming out of all your holes. I'll turn over and jack off all over you. Um, yeah, I don't know how many more of these screenshots I'm going to read. I think you get the picture, but let me get to John Laurinaitis. We'll get to where Brock Lesnar comes in all of this, and then we'll start bringing it home. On one occasion, he instructed Miss Grant, do not knock on the door, because if I see you, I will. Uh, it begins with the letter R, and it rhymes with grape, everyone. I will mm, you in the hallway. To leave no doubt regarding the dynamic of their relationship, on May 12, 2020, McMahon text Miss, Miss Grant, I'm the only one who owns you and controls who I want to fuck you. A theme that was often reiterated throughout the involvement. On January 17th, 2020, Miss Grant sent text to McMahon noting her one year, uh, I guess, employment with the company. A month later, Mr. McMahon reminded Ms. Grant about the far end reaching results of his texting and explicit content of her. By now, thousands of men see you every day all over the world. They all want to fuck you. Around this time, McMahon openly shared explicit photographs and salacious stories about Ms. Grant with WWE crew at WWE tapings, a group Mr. McMahon referred to as her fan club. Indeed, Mr. McMahon exuberantly messaged her a truthful story about having just shared explicit content of her with a group of 12 men on the WWE tech crew and recounted the obscene details he shared with them. I'm not reading all this, everyone, but I'll just read you a part of it. I just passed my phone around to a bunch of guys on the tech crew. They're all screaming, oh, my God, she's fucking beautiful. Look at that ass. I'd like to get that. I paused to count out loud how many guys there were, 12, and I then said, okay, there's 12 of you, and she would love to have sex with each and every one of you at one time. These guys cheered, but she will only do, do it if she takes three at a time. That brought a reaction. She wants one deeper in her tulo. Uh, culo, one down her throat and one in her vagina. And you could pound her and keep on pounding her until you pop your load. Yeah. Gangbang fantasy, everyone. If anybody wants to reference it, it's number 147 on the lawsuit. Number 148 on the occasions where Miss Grant informed Mr. McMahon that she was physically injured during their sexual encounter. McMahon's responses varied from apologies to non-accountable pushback and blaming impulse control. When encounters were particularly brutal, Ms. Grant learned to bookend the truth of her injuries with compliments to create the least amount of pushback from McMahon. My friends, I think that's going to be part of Vince McMahon's proof. She must know that she must have sent very explicit text messages too. Let me read 148 one more time. When encounters were particularly brutal, 
Miss Grant learned to bookend the truth of her injuries with compliments to create the least amount of pushback from McMahon. That means she knows he's got that. I'm telling you, that's going to come out. However, Miss Grant, listen, before anybody tries to, you know, go there, she does not deserve to be hurt. I don't care if he even turns her on. You do not, you do not, you do not, you do not hurt anybody. Um, but by saying that she bookend the truth, that means she she's saying that she lied to him. I think this is where she knows that Vince probably has proof on his end that she was a willing recipient of this. Again, my friends, we don't know anything personal about Janelle Grant. We don't know a damn thing about Janelle Grant. We don't know if she was some naive, you know, person close to 30, you know, that just did not see this coming. We don't know if she was sexual curious. We don't know if she was into this stuff. We don't know if she became into it. We don't know. We don't know. But we get to John Laurinaitis. I feel bad again for Johnny Ace's wife. Number 149. On August 20, 28th, 2020, Ms. Grant texts McMahon that she was injured during the latest sexual account, a result of McMahon's insistence on penetrating Ms. Grant's with extra large sex toys, including a vibrating wand that caused her to panic. McMahon ignored her warning that the device was not meant for insertion and for forcibly shoved the wand inside her so deeply that it became stuck for a period. She texts that she was in pain and bleeding a lot between last night and today and, quote, I am on the floor right now because I can't get comfortable. And on August 29, 2020, she texted him with an update that she was still very uncomfortable and I got hurt in some way I'm having trouble describing. McMahon did apologize, saying, sometimes I get carried away. During this time, Miss Grant became so sick from the stress of the situations that McMahon had subjected her to that her weight plummeted to just over 100 pounds, to which Mr. McMahon ignored. One distressing event happened on November 21st, 2020, when Mr. McMahon drove Miss Grant to WWE headquarters to fulfill his fantasy of having a sexual encounter with her in his office, causing Miss Grant to suffer a panic attack in the passenger seat while pleading with McMahon to change his mind to drive her back home. McMahon scoffed and then gave her an, an ultimatum, either have a sexual encounter in his office or inside the parked car. Terrified, Miss Grant obeyed McMahon's direction as they entered WWE headquarters for the encounter. Further, despite Mrs. Grant's repeated statements that she did not consent to threesomes with McMahon and physical therapist, McMahon advised, advertised her to others and told her that he had found another person to join them, John Laurinaitis. In November 2020, McMahon pressed Miss Grant to make explicit photos and videos to send to Laurinaitis. McMahon orchestrated exchanges by instructing Miss Grant when to create explicit content for Laurinaitis, including what to say and providing her with notes to adjust her performance. McMahon then facilita facilitated the exchange of explicit content back and forth between Miss Grant and John Laurinaitis. Notably, even one phone number, notably even one once phone numbers were exchanged between the two, McMahon insisted that her that he be privy to any messages that Miss Grant sends to Laurinaitis, and demanded that she report back about all interactions, further illustrating the level of control he had over Miss Grant. On or about December 29, 2020, a threesome was arranged between McMahon, Laurinaitis, and Miss Grant at McMahon's condo. McMahon instructed her to tell Laurinaitis that she was a neighbor and girlfriend working in the legal field, but not in WWE. Shortly after meeting Laurinaitis, Ms. Grant asked him if she was the first woman whom McMahon had introduced him to such a setting. Laurinaitis failed to respond and shot a look directly at McMahon, who quickly intervened by kissing Ms. Grant 
initiating the sexual encounter between the three of them. Let, let's stop there for a second, everyone. She looked at John Laurinaitis and said, am I the first woman to have a threesome with Vince and you? And John Laurinaitis looked at Vince, I guess, about to laugh. And Vince immediately started kissing her. You, you could see how this is like a bad movie. In the days that followed, McMahon texted her to Laurinaitis, hugged me like a bear, and said thank you to me about 12 times already. In contrast, John Laurinaitis messaged Miss Grant, thanks for the fun afternoon. On or about January 25th, 2021, Ms. Grant was reassigned to directly support WWE's new hire, a high-ranking employee in the legal department. February 5th, 2021, McMahon sent Ms. Grant to establish a schedule for when other men, including physical therapist and John Laurinaitis, could have sex with Ms. Grant, to which Ms. Grant attempted to rebuff. Here's another text message. Vince, exactly, baby. Uh, he's not the only one. She blanks out again, physical therapist. Called me this afternoon begging to eat you and, you know, eat you with his nice and hard penis. She says, give me another week, baby, and I'll be ready. I'm feeling more like myself. It's not great, but it's getting better. Tell him soon. That's her response to Vince. Vince says, and I return, and I quote, I already told him, baby. By the way, Johnny wants Tuesdays but not this coming one, but the occasional Saturday, but maybe I could shift to Thursday nights. Johnny would like all of the above. Texts like this, a shift schedule, caused Miss Grant to suffer breakdowns on how her original hope for a new life had been reduced to a objectified and dehumanized existence with no way out. On or about March 6, 2021, a second threesome between McMahon, Laurinaitis, and Miss Grant occurred. Unfortunately, Ms. Grant's transfer to the Talent Relations Department came with the ex ex expectation from both McMahon and Laurinaitis that she engage with Laurinaitis sexually, both physically and with explicit content. On March 10, 2021, WWE Corporate Officer No. 2 informed Grant that day that she would officially be moved to the Talent Relations and would quickly begin reporting to Laurinaitis, although details about her role including a title and salary, was still being firmed up. In essence, Ms. Grant again found herself in a completely undefined role, except for the understanding that she would remain a sexual slave to be used and trafficked by McMahon within the WWE. I think we're getting to Brock Lesnar now, everyone. On March 12, 2021, McMahon reminded her of the connection between her job and her role as a sexual object. Let's work hard and play hard too. March 16, 2021, Ms. Grant was directed to pick up a key to Laurinaitis' hotel room and serve herself to him as breakfast before the start of the week. McMahon constantly reinforced the expectation that Ms. Grant sexually performed for him and for her new boss, Laurinaitis, both in and out of the office. McMahon wrote on March 22, 2021, quote, do you promise to make me proud, baby? Will you show him what a porno star you are or what a porno star you can be? Will you show off for me like you never before? And on days when he's in town, I want him to bang you every morning and later in the office too. McMahon also indicated on April 2nd, 2021, that Miss Grant should obey if Laurinaitis wanted to bring in yet more men. Screenshot. Maybe he wants two other guys to join with him. Holy shit. You've told him you would do anything with him. And so if he surprised you with two others, you would have no alternative than to take them on. Oh, my God. The stories you could tell me then. It makes me want to mm, right now. By the way, I just thought of what an excellent idea. Maybe you can hint that if he knows someone who can be discreet, it might be better if you and Johnny try to out first, try him out first, so he could get more comfortable before he is introduced to me. And that makes total sense, doesn't it? All right. Let's get to Brock. Let's get to Brock. 
April 2021 meeting between Ms. Grant and Corporate Officer Number Two acknowledged that the jump initially proposed to Vice Pre- to the Vice President was too big, could put a target on Ms. Grant's back. Nevertheless, Corporate Officer Number Two presented Ms. Grant with paperwork detailing a base salary increase to two hundred thousand as Director of Operations. As soon as Ms. Grant began working for Laurinaitis, forcibly touching and overly sexual behaviors became part of daily life when he was in the office. On numerous occasions, Ms. Grant was directed to visit Laurinaitis in his hotel room before work to serve herself to him as his breakfast. Those devastating experiences made Ms. Grant feel as though she was being played, pimped out as an object for sexual gratification for her new boss. Upon information and belief, corporate funds from the WWE would be used to finance Laurinaitis hotel stays when these coerced sexual encounters occurred. Per McMahon's instructions, Ms. Grant reported interactions with Laurinaitis, with Laurinaitis back to McMahon, for whom the story served as a source of arousal. The arrangement with Laurinaitis left Ms. Grant miserable and, en- and enraged. However, in her years of experience with McMahon, she knew her request to stop would be ignored at best or used to destroy her career and reputation at worst. Ms. Grant was further left isolated by colleagues and surveilled by the WWE top-level employees. Professionally and personally, Ms. Grant's fate was entirely in the hands of McMahon, Laurinaitis, and the other WWE executives who enabled her abuse. On May 24, 2021, McMahon messaged Ms. Grant to remind her that a mistake could destroy her career and that she should pursue verbal communication rather than written where public. Those compliments will keep on coming, baby. Just wait and see. I totally understand and agree uh, you're being scared of communicating in photos. Johnny gets drunk and sloppy and could easily make a mistake that could cost him his job and yours too. Verbal communication is the way to go. That said, have you and Johnny talked about breakfast tomorrow? Her response We haven't discussed it at all. It's up in the air. Johnny complained about getting a new phone and it just arrived. I haven't set up time to coordinate setting it up with IT because I need him to assure me that he's erased everything that he saved. Truly regret that he ever got pics. It's not worth the stressing I'm feeling. Uh, I'm, I've come to it, come with it. Okay, whatever. All right. Let's get to Brock should be right around the corner. I'm looking at, uh, let's see, June 15, 2021, McMahon and Laronitis ignored her picks and brought her into Laronitis' office, forcibly touching and undressing her before forcing her to engage in a threesome on a conference table. Ms. Grant pleaded, no, 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 please stop. McMahon responded with, no means yes. Ms. Grant again told him to stop. Instead, McMahon licked his fingers and penetrated Ms. Grant and said, take it, bitch. With each taking turns restraining her for the other, Laurinaitis then joined by forcibly shoving his tongue, then penis, into her mouth. June 23rd, 2021, around 11.42 a.m., Mr. McMahon directed Ms. Grant in the middle of a workday to meet him on the lower floor. When Ms. Grant arrived, McMahon led her inside his private locker room, locked the door, and forced himself on her on a message table. Later that day, $15,000 in gift cards to Bloomingdale's were purchased at McMahon's direction and delivered by McMahon's personal assistant to Ms. Grant at, in her office. On multiple occasions, while Ms. Grant worked under Laurinaitis, including after McMahon's promise that one-on-one encounters would end, even after his wife moved across the country to join John Laurinaitis, he would call Ms. Grant to his office, lock the door, unzip his pants, and instruct Mr. Grant, Ms. Grant to perform oral sex. All right. Um, let's, I'm skipping through to get to Brock Lesnar. Let's see. Uh, did, okay, here, okay. All right, here we go. Here's Brock Lesnar. August 2021, August 26th, WWE held its second biggest annual event, SummerSlam, in Las Vegas's Allegiant Stadium. 
Around this time, McMahon and WWE superstar privately reached an informal agreement about his return. That night, McMahon texted Miss Grant a reminder that she was an enslaved object to him. Quote, I want to drive you lower and lower, so low that you might beg me to sell you. McMahon continued to advertise a sexual encounter with Miss Grant to WWE superstar during the formal uh, negotiation of a new business contract with WWE. And here's the screenshot that supposedly involves Brock Lesnar. Um, let's see. Uh, it should be this one. Here we go. Here's what so-and-so said after I told them that part of the deal was fucking you. LOL, that's your turf. She will be ruined after me and leave your ass. Plus, after me, your tool won't fit in anymore. Supposedly, that was rumored to be Brock's response to Vince. Now, again, I don't condone any of this willingly or not. But when I get to Brock now, and I say this not as defending Brock or being a fan, you tell me where Brock legally did anything, where people online are insisting on his remove from WWE. Okay. In December of 2021, McMahon gave Miss Grant's personal cell phone number to WWE superstar and promised she'll do anything requested of her. In the days that followed, WWE superstar revealed a fetish to Miss Grant and tested McMahon's promise that Miss Grant would do anything with a request that she send a video of herself urinating. Unable to recognize herself, Miss Grant went numb and obeyed. WWE superstar informed Miss Grant that if she had not complied with the request, WWE superstar would have lost any interest he had in her and called her a bitch. The same month, WWE superstar expressed to Miss Grant his desire to set up a play date and have a sexual encounter. However, a snowstorm changed WWE superstar's travel plans, and Miss Grant's ultimately used the weather and COVID as an excuse to back out. I think that's the extent of Brock Lesnar's involvement in this lawsuit, everybody. We finish up early 2022, January 2022. McMahon abruptly distanced himself from Miss Grant, saying that he could not speak to her or be in the same room with her. On January 9th, 2022, McMahon agreed to speak with Miss Grant at his condo. During the meeting, Miss McMahon told Miss Grant that his wife Linda had learned about his relationship with Miss Grant, that he was losing his condo, and that she would divorce him. He asked added, too, that a public divorce would make Miss Grant a headline. Uh, to try to salvage his marriage and avoid both the negative publicity and other repercussions of a divorce, Vince McMahon wanted to ensure Miss Grant that she would remain silent about his personal misconduct in order to preserve his controlling interest in WWE. McMahon told Miss Grant that if she left WWE, and signed an NDA. He was confident that Linda McMahon would not divorce him and he could remain in the condo and Miss Grant would avoid, uh, rep, rep, uh, I guess, um, that would avoid, I guess, permanent harm on Vince McMahon. I, 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 the, the, just so everybody knows, because it's on the screen, I see very, very small print. So, and I highlighted it. So it's a little bit vague, you know, when I see this print. So anyway, here's the NDA, and we'll bring this home. Vince McMahon instructed Miss Grant that she should not go back to the office and immediately lessen her involvement and open, open work items. Miss Grant expressed concerns about both her name being mentioned in the media and loss of control of her image, especially as McMahon had shared content of her for close to two years and the ramifications for her career. McMahon suggested that he would only attempt to help Miss Grant's reputation and keep it intact and that he or corporate officer number one would personally help Miss Grant to find another job. McMahon also instructed Miss Grant 
to not share this news with anyone and suggested that she offer health-related excuses about leaving WWE. Regarding the NDA, Ms. Grant asked McMahon, is this when Jerry sends the papers? McMahon nodded and assured Ms. Grant that they would be in the driver's seat to iron out terms together, but she would not need an attorney and to make things official and approved of Miss Grant asking celebrity doctor for an attorney referral. Following, imagine that you go to a doctor, you go to the physician, they, 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 they have sex with you numerous times. They crap on your head or at least, you know, and she's going to him. Do you have a lawyer? Unbelievable. Following the discussion, McMahon led Miss Grant to his bedroom for another sexual encounter. I, just, I, I, I don't remember reading that before. Unbelievable. I, I'm telling you, it's a bad fucking, it's, it's this disturbing. This is the world of billionaires. This is the world of billionaires. It's sick, but oh my God. On January 14, 2022, McMahon sent Miss Grant a to-do list for purposes of he effectuating the NDA, such as retaining counsel, and also included an offer for one-on-one -on -one career coaching. McMahon suggested the list had been drafted by WWE Corporate Officer Number 2. Before Ms. Grant retained counsel, McMahon discussed the amount of money that would be exchanged for the NDA and settled on a lump sum of $3 million after Ms. Grant told McMahon his initial offer of $1 million was not enough to compensate for the lost earnings potential and the fact that she would be unable to continue the promised career trajectory of vice president, as well as failing to last as director for one year. On January 24th, 2022, McMahon continued to engage in sexual text messages with Miss Grant, including encouraging her to send an explicit photo to WWE superstar. McMahon also requested Miss Grant to send him content that he had sent to WWE Superstar. In, in other words, send me a copy of whatever you send to Brock. Then, but there's no nothing in the lawsuit that she ever did. The negotiations of the NDA were brief, lasting only eight days. Miss Grant reminded McMahon that the NDA ought to address people who knew about their relationship, including but not limited to. Corporate officer number one, two, John Laurinaitis, McMahon's personal assistants. Ms. Grant and her attorney sought to incorporate the list of individuals who had knowledge of the relationship in a Schedule A of the NDA. Ms. Grant's request of revisions were flatly rejected by McMahon and the WWE, who reverted to their original draft rather than incorporate any of her proposed changes, with the exception that as of this execution, Ms. Grant would not speak about the relationship. In the state of mental defeat and fear from Mr. McMahon's threats, Ms. Grant succumbed to his unrelenting pressure and signed the NDA just before the deadline, January 28th, 2022. On February 4th, 2022, Ms. Grant was wired $1 million as the first installment of the NDA. On February 28th, Ms. Grant was wired $10,000 to cover attorney's fees related to the NDA. Both wires were sent with the originator described as Vincent K. McMahon in care of WWF, an originator address, 1241 East Main Street, Stanford, Connecticut, 06902. On February 9th and 10th of 2022, Ms. Grant gave notice to John Laurinaitis and put human resources at WWE on official notice she was leaving the company. After the NDA was signed, McMahon, wearing only a white robe, met Ms. Grant in his condo to review the outstanding business items. As Ms. Grant was proceeding to the door to leave, McMahon grabbed her arm before she exited and commanded her to do one last thing and said, get on your knees. As Ms. Grant knelt on the hard floor, barely a few feet away from the front door, McMahon opened his robe and ordered her to eat him. McMahon grabbed the back of Ms. Grant's head and slammed her face into his crotch. You get the deal, everybody. 
On March 2nd, 2022, while Miss Grant was away on a trip to Florida, McMahon called Miss Grant to advise that it would be probably the last time she would hear from him, and that if she needed anything, to contact WWE corporate officer number one or number two. Over the course of approximately half-hour call, McMahon lamented both about his inability to focus on the upcoming WrestleMania and how his personal life had blown up over the last few weeks. Towards the end of the conversation, McMahon and Miss Grant uh, agreed to resume contact after WrestleMania. Unfucking believable. He also instructed Miss Grant to continue having sexual relations with other men including WWE Superstar in the meantime. On or around March 4, 2022, WWE Superstar messaged Miss Grant that he was in New York. In line with Mr. McMahon's orders, Miss Grant text WWE Superstar explicit pictures. On March 27, 2022, WWE Superstar reached out to Miss Grant again. Miss Grant interpreted these back-to-back -back advances as an indication of McMahon's continued control. On March 30th, 2022, Ms. Grant's counsel received a call from McMahon's attorney advising that there had been an anonymous email about their relationship between Ms. Grant, Vince McMahon, and John Laurinaitis. Later in June and early Ju July 2022, stories were published regarding the matter of McMahon's multiple NDAs with various women associated with WWE and others, Ms. Grant did not receive another payment under the NDA in February of 2023. Further, despite assurances from McMahon that he would cover her medical care and the cost associated with her tax liability for the $1 million payment, yeah, guys, she had to pay taxes on it. McMahon had refused to cover these costs. McMahon continued to pay for Miss Grant's medical care until April 15th, 2022, when it abruptly stopped. From And then they list the gifts that Vince McMahon gave her. From 2019 until early 2022, McMahon provided Miss Grant with gifts to keep her under McMahon's control. Upon information and belief, the gifts provided to her included ones purchased by McMahon, and expensed them to WWE. Examples of the items, alternative clinic medical care and medical and cosmetic services and products, clubhouse access to the Belmont Stakes, WrestleMania private full-day transportation and premium tickets, $20,000 towards surgery paid directly to a surgeon's office, Pearl Diamond Pave Lariat Necklace from Betteridge in Greenwich, Connecticut. Blue Cashmere Knee Length Cardigan. Blue Burberry Check Cashmere uh, Scarf. Blue Cashmere and a Fur Hat from Nordstrom. Gray Cashmere sh uh, Shawls from Nordstrom. Celine Sunglasses, a Cable Knit Throw Blanket. Large Bouquets of Flowers deliberately approximately every other week 2022 bmw 430 xl $5,000 gift certificate for lanfear spa two private chef catered dinners in mcmahon's condo gold and diamond paved paperclip necklace from betteridge in greenwich connecticut fifteen thousand dollars in bloomingdale gift cards Food assortment displays and antique tea ceremony set from Saudi Arabia and large bouquets of flowers delivered approximately every other week. They, 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 they're outlining the years, 2019, 2020, and 2021. So just to finish this up, they feel the NDA violates the Speaks Out Act and is unenforceable. The NDA is also void and unenforceable because the confidential confidentiality term, uh, a core term, is overly broad in this uh, on its face. As written, it would prevent Ms. Grant from saying anything to anyone about WWE or her employment there, which, of course, she would need to do to apply for a job, let alone exposing McMahon and other sexual assaults and abuse from Ms. Grant. The NDAs that McMahon has used to silence other women 
may be equally unenforceable if the same language was used. I need a shower. Oh, my God. I didn't think it was going to take that long to read. Holy shit. Holy shit. Oh my God. Listen. After hearing that, Vince McMahon is a pig. Brock Lesnar, in my opinion, did nothing wrong. Uh, I don't know his marriage to Sable. I don't know if that's Brock Lesnar, but, you know, when they... The way they describe it, it sure sounds like it. When you look at the dates of the negotiation and contracts, it sounds like it. As far as the WWE referee, uh, a lot of people have said Drake Younger. I don't know if it's him, but I am left with this. And you know me. I mean, this is not a joke. This is serious, disgusting shit. Again, fuck the innocent until proven guilty. Even if Vince McMahon did not traffic her, even if she enjoyed it, but it went out of control. Even if there's no crime committed, this behavior is not professional. It's an abuse of power. Vince McMahon will not clear his name out of this. The only argument Vince McMahon, there's only two arguments Vince McMahon could do. Either say, I didn't do it, none of this is true, or she wanted it. She loved it. She enjoyed it. She was a willing participant of it. I don't know what is true. I'm not going to take a path simply because I don't like somebody. Uh, but I truthfully believe Vince McMahon, although I appreciate the 43 years, 45 years of being a wrestling fan, that's how long I've been a wrestling fan, since 1979. Although I appreciate the platform that he has brought wrestling, uh, it does not, all those years do not uh, give you credit. So when you become a disgusting, weird sex addict that uses his power to, you know, just turn things into something just bizarre, uh, you don't get credit for it. Just like I've always said, I love Chris Benoit's wrestling career. You know, and the guy was a good man. I didn't know him personally, but I'm not going to take all those decades of enjoying Chris Benoit or 15 years or whatever. And then, and, and, oh, well, he was a great wrestler. You know, we should celebrate his Hall of Fame. No, you killed somebody. That's it. You, you're not celebrated. I, uh, I don't know what's true or what's not. My impression from this, and this is just opinion, is that you don't go to somebody's condo over and over and over and over. And then for two or three months, you don't have a job yet, but little by little, you know, a hug, caress, you know, more and more and more. Again, you know, we're not talking about an 18-year-old naive person that doesn't, this seems like someone who obviously, you know, was in a bad situation, but, you know, Think about the three months leading up to it. Where's the, the resident manager? Where's the best friends? Where's the Google search? Vince, you know, I know what you did in the past, and I'm telling you, I'm not going to be part of that. Sorry. You know, you want me to work for you? I'll go to WWE offices. You know, go to condo, 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 condo. You know, it's just, you, you know, at some point you got to say to yourself, you know, I don't know how much she was a willing participant. It sure feels like that she definitely was was willingly in the beginning, and then it got obviously way out of control. And she was in a, listen, I, I can only imagine the pressure of being threatened to have your life ruined by a billionaire if you dare go public. Um, very courageous to file this lawsuit. But what disturbs me is why do you give the physical therapist a past? Why do you give, why do you not out the celebrity doctor so other people don't get deceived? Prevent someone else from going what you went through. How do you not mention them? 
that's why, you know, when if someone does something to you, you don't accuse them or not accuse them based on if you have text messages or not. You hear what the, just imagine now, now you see the IWC, how they've reacted to this. They insist on Triple H's job, some, many of them. They insist on Brock Lesnar's job, but yet none of them say, how is this therapist not in this lawsuit? How is this doctor not outed? How is employee number one, employee number two, how come the referees are, are anonymous in this? If somebody did something and it's horrible and it's, you know, possibly illegal, how are you not drag him into, how do you not mention a name? Why would you blacken out the name? In fear of a lawsuit? They took advantage of you. They abused you. In fear of a lawsuit? To me, this sounds like let's only sue the people that we have the strongest case against. In my opinion, let's sue the people that we have the strongest case against. The other people that hurt you, we don't have proof. So we'll just leave them out of it. And meanwhile, those people could be doing shit to other people out there, could be abusing other people out there, could be having all this un unlawful practice, and they get a pass simply because you can't sue them. That's the problem that I have on that side of it. Vince will never be brought back to WWE unless he's on his deathbed and people just realize, you know, this is not, you know, he's just incapacitated. But again, there is things about this lawsuit. And plus, you got the NDA. You got a million dollars given to you. You give your notice and you go back to the fucking condo and you have sexual relations again? Am, am I missing something here? It's not comedy. None of this is funny. Naming dildos after WWE wrestlers is just weird. You know, I wish I could even like laugh about that, but it's just weird. You know, it's just, again, it just, this is a weird sex addict with billions. I, I, I don't want to bring in anybody else with this, but, you know, there are billionaires and there are billionaires. You know, if Tony Khan wants to just piss away tens of millions of dollars because he loves wrestling and wants to pay, not make a profit about it. We enjoy it. All right. That's his right with his money. You know, at least he's not abusing or his power. You know, he might be irresponsible and you might be immature, but he does not abuse his power. You know, it's, this is just, you know, again, you know what the funny thing is? And we'll stop bringing this home because my God, we end up going three hours. Hey, we're going to stop doing Saturdays on a regular basis. We might as well go out in style, right? But you know, it's interesting. I bet you, and I have a couple of friends in the adult film industry I became friendly with over the years. I'm not going to contact them publicly, but privately. I'm very curious what their reaction is to this. Not, not the woman herself. The treatment of her sounds awful. It sounds, listen, you know, I'm going to just say it point blank. I think this was a naive girl who was definitely sexually curious. We see low budget movies where you see women go to a party with billionaires. You'll see a 70 or an 80 year old. Hey, I'll hit them. I'll, I'll, I'll hit that. You know, if I could get some stuff out I, and I'm not saying that that was her, but my point is this, you know, I could see that there's a, some sexual curiosity here and liked it, but then it got to a level that it just, I think Vince, you know, you have fantasies. Some of you, you might have a fantasy to want to have a threesome. So you might have a fantasy that you want to, you know, have sex in a park. Some of you might have a fantasy that whatever it is, I don't care. Unfortunately, some people out there have some wild, perverse, dominating, you know, just flat out weird fantasies. And what comes off of Vince McMahon, and it's funny because when you go back to the Blackheart Sports Entertainment Hotline that I used to do with Mad Zombie and Brian Damage more than 20 years ago, we used to talk about Vince McMahon, you know, in storylines, making out in front of his wife, 
you know, Eric Bischoff, like hitting on Linda. I, listen, it's storyline. But I always used to say at that time, I said, you know, there's something about that family that it's almost like a per perversion that I almost think like Linda McMahon liked seeing her husband making out with Trish. Yeah, I don't know if any of you go back to my hotline days, but back then, you know, a lot of people used to be like, you know, to put this, this is not, this is not just about a greedy Mr. McMahon in 2001. The bathroom shower scene with Tori Wilson and Stacey Keebler and the Trish Stratus, it felt like, no, nah, this is not a storyline about an older billionaire trying to take control. It felt like kind of like a fantasy. It always did. Did I ever think it would get to this? To get to this, let alone, let's be honest. My dad is 74. No, 75. He just turned 75, January 6th. I can't picture my dad being that sexually active. You like I can't like I see like other people I know that are in their 70s, and I'm like, you know, how do you do this at that age? It's just bizarre. It's bizarre. Um, so look, one other thing. The people out there calling for Triple H's head. Uh, take note that Triple H is not mentioned in this at all. Take note it's not even hinted that Triple H was in this at all. Remember Triple H had heart surgery and was out for almost a year. Take note that they are very explicit as to who knew the relationship. I'm sure there were some people there that, you know, kind of had their, you know, their, their thoughts like, I think they're going together think there's something going on but the idea that people are trying to portray this is the popular thing on social media the last 12 hours they knew yeah that'll get you a thousand likes but you're just as naive and ignorant and dopey as someone else that says some of the most dumbest things out there you know you don't know you don't know exactly who knew what did we know for a long time that vince mcmahon was a pig sure Sure, we didn't know that it would be on this level, but the idea that everybody thinks that everybody in the WWE offices knew that it got to that level, it's crazy. I saw wrestling news sites today reporting uh, WWE employees very close to Vince McMahon may be fired. Go look around, go Google it. There's about 50 wrestling news sites today reporting that. No, you know what the title is? They want employees that were close to Vince McMahon to be fired. That's what it is. That's our news. That's their hopes. That's their hopes. We don't know. But it's going to be really interesting what Vince McMahon's response to this is. If this shit gets settled at a court, honestly, if I'm Janelle Grant, and I'm Janelle Grant's lawyers, you do not settle. She will go down in infamy as that one person that sure, instead of calling the cop, she called the lawyer. Let's be honest. But she could go down as that one person that said, no, I'm, I was manipulated in the NDA. I'm not going to be manipulated. I'm not going to be silenced this time around. If she settles out of court and this gets dismissed to me i think this was someone who was scorned who was mistreated and it went to a level that i don't think she, she, anybody would have ever envisioned including her but in the end money mattered because if money did not matter all of those disgusting disturbing people that were in the three ways with you that hurt you that injured you physically and mentally, maybe you can't sue them. Maybe you can't file criminal charges against them, but you sure as hell could warn someone else out there who may be getting abused as we speak and do not unfortunately have a billionaire employer that they could go after. So I want to see where this goes. I want to see what Vince McMahon's response to this is. And man, if those other names get mentioned, boy, is it going to be wild.
it's going to be wild. So, all right. Um, before we go out get out of here, I want to get into this week in ratings. Um, thank you very much. Charlie Weiss from the last belt loop DT. I used to watch you years ago. You're a good guy. Always keeping it real. Keep up the success. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for the five spot. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, I try to keep it real. Believe me, there are going to be some people that are going to hear my opinions on it and get very, very angry. You know, I'm just trying to be fair across the line. Vince is done and I don't want to see him back. Uh, he's disgusting and he took advantage of his power. But I will say that remember, remember, this NDA was signed in early 2022. When that email, anonymous email started floating around, three board board of directors members in WWE were let go by Vince. Makes you wonder if they started finding out things and Vince tried to silence them by letting them go. Do they end up filing a lawsuit against Vince? I don't know. Not a lawyer. Couldn't answer that. But thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Wrestling ratings. Let's get into them. Very quickly. Uh, oh, I got to plug it one more time. Two days. Monday night. Kevin and I return. Don Tony and Kevin Castle show. Every Monday night, 11, 15 p.m. on our Discord channel. We did uh, the Discord on Tuesday, and it went fairly smooth. Um, just if we do audio sound bites in the future, I got to figure out a different way of sharing them live on the shows. But uh, dtkcdiscord.com. If you're not signed up yet, do so. That's the only way you could tune in live. So um, let's get into ratings. Now, as I said earlier, Impact Wrestling, uh, the 18th, the first in, uh, TNA Impact under the TNA banner did 121,000 viewers, which is up. We'll get into this past Thursdays in a moment. SmackDown, Friday the 19th of uh, January did 2,408,000 viewers up slightly from the week prize, 2,384,000. The fatal four way contract signing where Roman refused to come out at the beginning of the show. Paul Heyman had that little interaction with, uh, with uh, Randy in the ring and AJ and LA Knight went at it. That did 2,709,000. The low point of SmackDown was the women's tag team title match. And the post-match angle, this was where the Kabuki Warriors um, confronted Kane and Carter and Katana Chance. Yeah, Katana Chance and Kane and Carter, they fought uh, Unholy Union. I said earlier that they only defended the belt twice against, well, once against Piper Nevin and Chelsea Green. But yeah, the Unholy Union, they defended as well. That was the low point along with Cross's response to Bobby Lashley that did 2277000 the positive from that SmackDown, the fatal four-way contract signing broke 2.7 million viewers, which is very, very rare these days. Even Roman sometimes doesn't get that. The Kevin Owens, Logan Paul segment jumped 150,000 viewers as it went on. After the opening quarter, the rating was extremely consistent the whole night. Quarter two was 2,466,000. The final quarter was 2,391,000. So they maintained most of their viewers after the opening. The negative was that the LWO versus Legado del Fantasma lost 400,000 viewers during the match. The women's tag team title match and Cross's response to Bobby Lashley lost 200,000 viewers. Although most of that 200,000 was during the women's tag match, not really Cross with Lashley. And we're not saying that because we support Cross. This is just a fact. Rampage. Last Friday the 19th did 390,000 viewers. Slightly down from the week prize, 396. Wrestling on Friday night last week was slightly down across the board. Jeff Hardy versus Darby Allen was the high at 405. Chris Statlander versus Aminata and the another backstage segment with Jay Lethal and company did 377. High point is that it was a shitty rating, but it was a steady rating. The hours, the breakdown, hour one, 389, hour two, 391. So they kept their viewers. The negative was that Jeff Hardy and Darby Allen barely broke 400,000. 
Chris Jericho versus Matt Seidel did not break 400,000. And once again, Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett and company are the lowest rating of the night. Collision for January 20th did 441,000, slightly up from the week prior's 400. The high point was the Tony Storm promo and the first half of Buddy Matthews and Daniel Garcia. Interesting, interesting. That did 466,000 viewers. The low point, unfortunately, was Thunder Rose's singles return, beating Aminata. So Aminata, two shows back-to-back, -back, lowest part of the night. Not her fault. Fans don't know her yet. And the backstage promo with Eddie Ortiz and uh, Eddie Kingston and <laughs> Ortiz. I said Eddie Ortiz. Ortiz and Eddie Kingston did 418. The positive was that they were back to a nice steady rating, no big drops like the week before. Nothing hit 500,000, but nothing was below 400,000. Hour two scored slightly higher than hour one, which does not happen often with collision. Their breakdown was 430 to first hour, 452 to second hour. The negative was that Thunder Rose's first singles match back was the lowest. Adam Copeland versus Dante Martin was the second lowest match of the night. Would you ever think that we would mention Adam Copeland multiple times as far as the lowest ratings for AEW programming? Adam Copeland's name will be brought, brought up again very shortly. Raw from this past Monday night did 1,686,000, way up from the week prior's 1,419,000. The high point was Cody Rhodes and CM Punk's confrontation, which did a crazy 1,912,000 viewers. The low point was Drew McIntyre's promo. Damage Control talking in the back with Tegan Knox and Natty. Damage Control with Adam Pearce and then Adam Pearce with Jinder Mahal and Indy Sheer. And the Royal Rumble video package. That did 1,478,000. The positive is that Raw was up almost 270,000 viewers in a week prior. Every quarter, except for quarter two, was above 1.6 million. CM Punk and Cody Rhodes gained 230,000 viewers for their segment. Nia Jax, Becky Lynch, and Bailey, their segment increased by 160,000 viewers. Damian Priest versus Drew McIntyre went up 115,000 viewers as the match went on. And every match gained viewers as they went on, except for the women's tag match. The negative, after CM Punk and Cody were done, Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae versus Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark dropped. Remember I told you? Remember I told you that the rating would have 300,000 plus more? They dropped 380,000 viewers. It's a little skewed because that was right after Cody and CM Punk, but still a big drop. Um, unfortunately, uh, one half of Chad Gable versus Ivar's match lost 180,000 viewers, although it gained back almost half their viewers as the match went on. Um, the Miz versus Dominic Mysterio, and get this, the Miz versus Dominic Mysterio, Nia Jax, Bailey, and Becky Lynch's segments drew higher than Seth Rollins' announcement about his injury. Pretty interesting, I think. All right. NXT for this past Tuesday. 642,000 viewers. Slightly down. Well, more than slightly down from the week prior, 683. The high point was the second half of Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin versus Nathan Frazier and Axiom, along with that segment, seeing William Regal make a cameo with Ava Rain. That, along with Trick Williams and Ilya with that backstage segment, did... 701,000 viewers. The low point, unfortunately, Roxanne Perez, Lara Vicaria, and Tatum Paxley's in, into fraction. Fans were not buying it. It was all the way down to 549,000. The high point was that Dragon Lee versus Scripps. Go figure. Dragon Lee versus Scripps gained 50,000 viewers as the match went on. Now, I know that may not sound like a lot, but again, NXT did 642. You multiply that by four, and that's a good SmackDown rating. 
So you multiply that increase by four, you would say Scripps versus Dragon Lee went up almost 200,000. That just give you an idea. Also, Baron Corbin and Braun Breaker's match gained 40,000 viewers as the match went on. The negative was that that 14-minute overrun with Tatum Paxley, Lava, Karen, Roxanne Perez, it lost 40,000 viewers off the main event. Lexus King versus Trey Bearhill lost 70,000 viewers. Blair Davenport versus Carmen Petrovic lost 65,000 viewers. And the main event and the overrun did not break 600,000. Dynamite from January 24th did 837,000 viewers down from the week prior is 891. The high point was the opener, Big Bang lead in, obviously, but there is a little asterisk to that, and it's a good one. Samoa Joe and Hooks recap, and then the first half of Penta versus Hangman Page, which did 1,068,000. Hour two, though, was over 900,000 still. I, excuse me, quarter two was over 900,000 still, and quarter three slightly broke 900,000. So even though you always get that big, big bang lead in, they still kept a good part of their audience. So the low point for Dynamite was Adam Copeland versus Minoru Suzuki. The final 15 minutes of Dynamite did 727,000 viewers, and if you want to include the overrun, because they did an overrun, it got worse. The overrun went down to 704. Now, you notice the Big Bang lead-in and an extra five minutes are designed to try to get the overall Dynamite viewership number up, even if it's a little. How many of you out there, like me, if you're trying to lose weight, you go on the scale and you, you're down a pound, but you feel better that if you take your socks and your pants off, you're like, hey, I'm down two pounds. That's what this feels like with this lead-in and an overrun that's not necessary. Budget your show better. You know, trying to add a couple of points. The positive for Dynamite, for some reason, which baffles me, Wardlow versus Trent. Maybe it was because of the Undisputed Kingdoms promo. That broke 900,000 viewers. I think it did 905. Hour one for Dynamite was really good in the rating. Hour one did 929,000 viewers. Unfortunately, hour two tanked. Hour two dropped all the way down to 752. The negative is that from the beginning of Dynamite to the end, every quarter went down. Every quarter. Their quarters were 1,066,907,902,840,750,000. Hour one, 727, and even that five-minute overrun went down to 704. The second half of Penta versus Hangman Page lost 100,000 viewers. Deanna Perrazzo and Tony Storm's confrontation lost 60,000 viewers. Jeff Hardy versus Swerve Strickland lost 45,000 viewers. And Adam Copeland versus Minoru Suzuki sucked in the ratings. No question about it. In Impact Wrestling from two nights ago, the 25th of January, 102,000 viewers, down from the week prior is 121. So this is the last visual we will ever see of Vince McMahon related to WWE and TKO. Earlier last week, when Dwayne Johnson was added to the board of directors, and in a matter of days, this would all come crumbling down for Vince McMahon. You know, you know, I'll say one thing in closing about Vince. I don't know how you feel about this. I, I, something that I've thought about, I can't help but to think to myself, being a billionaire, being close to 80, he was close to retirement. I wonder if he looks back, especially at the last four years. And I wonder if he says to himself, it was worth every damn minute of it. You know what I mean? Like, don't you think in a sick, perverted way, like he knew that his days in WWE were numbered. He knew that the only way he could return is if he pulls a power play. 
that I think, you know what? Fuck it. I'm 80. I'm a billionaire. You know, I've gotten all these women to sign NDAs. I, I, I've lived my life. If I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out blowing my, hmm. doesn't it feel that way? Like he had to have known, you know, like you, you feel like the excitement, that's what happens. Unfortunately, people with a, that are adrenaline junkies, you know, you start off, Oh, Ooh, mom and dad are upstairs. Ooh, we sneak, we sneak and you have fun and it's exciting. And then the excitement, it's not exciting anymore. So you want to do something else exciting and that's not exciting anymore. So now you want to do this exciting and then it goes here and then it gets to a point where it gets bizarre. That's what it kind of feels like here. So, but, uh, all right. We did three hours, 15 minutes. So to be continued as far as Saturdays go. So let me remind everyone that tomorrow we will do the sit down. It'll be live at 8.05 PM. That'll be the 28th of January. Then after tomorrow, we're going to test the sit down Friday nights at 10, right after SmackDown. That's what everybody voted as the majority. But I will tell you this up front. If the turnout on Fridays is not strong, there's no reason for me to stay up to three, four in the morning on a Friday night for the sit down if people are going to tune into other people's SmackDown recaps. The sit down on Fridays is not a SmackDown recap. We could comment about SmackDown, but it's the sit down is, you know, interactive, talking about topics. If the turnout for the first two weeks are light, it's going to go back to Sundays at eight. Or maybe it goes to Saturdays at noon, like we're doing now. I don't know. We'll see. But that's the plan. Saturdays with the Don Tony show are going to go away for a little while because Kevin and I are returning this Monday and a lot of the news will be discussed on Mondays. Now, because I did this today, do not expect this dive on Monday. On Monday, Kevin and I, when it comes to Vince McMahon, all we're going to do is give our take of what we think happened, the Brock Lesnar stuff, where this goes from here, and that's it. If you want reference points, you could come back to this episode and, and check it out here. But the Vince talk on Monday will be this much of the whole show. We have a lot of topics we're going to get into. And uh, tomorrow, during the day, I'm going to check out Chris Van Vliet's interview with uh, Velveteen Dream. I got to see what that's all about because you know my views about what happened many years ago. So we'll talk about that and a lot of other things. But yeah, join me tomorrow night at eight if you're interested. And we'll I'm sure we'll comment a little bit about the Royal Rumble. You know, Kevin and I are gonna talk about the Rumble on Monday too. If you're a Patreon member or a channel member, good luck with the contest. We'll see what happens tonight. Enjoy the Royal Rumble, my friends. I think it's gonna be a banger. And uh let's see what kind of surprises we get. Let's see if we get the returns that everybody is talking about and uh see who ends up winning. Um you know, it seems like a very predictable event, but at the same time, there's so much unknown because WWE, the last year and a half, especially, their writing has gone up a notch. You look at the bloodline, you look at a lot of the stories, they've definitely, how many times before a year and a half ago, did you ever see that Martin Scorsese thumbnail that says cinema? You rarely ever saw that posted when it comes to WWE over the last year and a half, they've done a lot better with their stories. So it makes me think that tonight cannot be simple. Tonight will be somewhat predictable, but I think at the same time, it's going to be complicated. So I think that's the only way that they go, but I thank you all as always for the support, much love. And I hope to catch you all again tomorrow. And especially Monday, the return full time. The Don, Tony, and Kevin Castle Show. Be well, everybody. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody-good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just tuck it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the hosts. 
I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right. He's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup, and I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.